The meeting is now live. Very good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on Governance Reform. Uh, today is February 6, 2023, and I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee. We're ready to begin, so Mr. Clerk, if you could please call the roll, please. Krikorian. Here. Raman. Here. Blumenfield. Present. Harris Dawson. Oh, wow. Hutt. Councilmember Hutt? Here. Hernandez? Here. Park? Six members and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, Councilmember Park is in another committee meeting right now, and she will be joining us as soon as uh, that one concludes. Um, so, uh, members, welcome back uh, to the Committee on Governance Reform. Um, this is our second meeting of the committee, and we're uh, going to be touching upon two of the central issues for, for forming this committee. So, as we begin, uh, of course, today is a special meeting, as all meetings of the Ad Hoc Committee will be. So, we'll be taking public comment on the agenda items. Uh, we will not be taking general public comment on issues outside of the scope of the ad hoc committee, uh, but we can take up to uh, two minutes uh, per speaker for uh, items that are on the agenda. So with that, Mr. Clerk, if you could please read in the call-in instructions so that we can get ready to, to begin taking public comment. Of course. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call one 669 Two five four five two five two, and use meeting ID number one six zero one five one five three one three, and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Very good. So the, the two general topics today will be uh, item one, which is updates to the city's existing municipal lobbying ordinance. And then uh, the other items all relate to creation of the independent redistricting commission, uh, both actions that will be taken by this council and that we'll be getting further report on uh, from the CLA uh, and also um, legislation that, that relates to that in Sacramento. So with that, um, members, uh, did anybody uh, want to offer any opening comments before we begin with public comment? Okay, um, seeing none, let's go ahead and, and begin with our first caller, please. Are we ready to begin with the first caller? First speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Go ahead, or all of the items. Go ahead, you'll have two minutes. All right, so I first would like to start by noting that this whole committee is really a joke. Um, yeah, so let's see, there are several items related to redistricting on the agenda today. Um, one of which is an item that was originally seconded by none other than Nuri Martinez. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to wonder about that. I see the item's been amended, like, several times, but it still seems like, okay, maybe you should kind of start fresh on that since, you know, we all know Nuri Martinez's role in the redistricting process last time, so maybe starting over anew would be the good, the best idea. On the item related to the city's, items related to the city's position on the state um, mo measures to um, 
have a um, independent redistricting committee that's created by the state government, or the provisions are created by the state government. I really think the city should just, you know, kind of stay out of that debate, or at least, you know, the city needs to be t looking, being very careful on that because again we all know what happened with the redistricting when the city ran it so well i have personal I issues with that with the state um me measure motion as well measure as well and i think it really should be something that the voters should probably be figuring out it's still you know the city's going to look ridiculous you know you're just basically all it's going to do is make the city look like you're you know saying oh well why don't you trust us this time after all of that well meanwhile the city can't even ever have a governance reform committee meeting with them um, that's chaired by someone who doesn't um actively silence protesters of kevin de leon still being in council and never holds meetings that allow for general public comment um so yeah, this whole committee is really a joke. Um, let's actually create a serious um, governance reform Jesus. committee. Next speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Speak of the last four digits, 9386. Please unmute yourself. Speak of the last four digits, 9386. This is your last call to unmute yourself before we move on. Okay, we'll move on to the next speaker. Next speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, speak on item one. You have one minute, go ahead. Okay, I uh, just want to uh, express my support for the Raman Amendment. The MLO has never been comprehensively updated, and every entity worth listening to has made clear that this needs to happen. Uh, the public deserves transparency. They deserve to know if a lobbyist is speaking before a neighborhood council, commission, or city council. And quite frankly, anyone who opposed this should be put under a microscope. If you don't want the public looking closer into who you go clay shooting with in your free time, it would be in your best interest to refrain from messing with this amendment and just pass it as written. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Uh, it's Rob Kwan. I'd like to know who's uh, shooting clay. Uh, I'm speaking on items one, two, three, and four. And I uh, just want to start by thanking Councilmember Raman for her leadership on reforming the MLO, and, and also thank Councilmember Corian for scheduling this matter. It's a sad reality, but merely scheduling this item is a huge step forward for this council. Past council presidents have left these proposals to die without even getting a hearing. This is the single most important thing you could do to reform our broken and battered city hall without amending our charter. I just want to highlight the C3 threshold and just knowing that uh, if you open a hole, big money's going to find a way. And we, we can't have uh, a process where we close loopholes and then open even bigger ones. Bids are not representative of the people at large. They are representative of special interests by design. Business owners, merchants, property owners, not people at large. And uh, the fundraising exemption or the fundraising loopholes are, are just a clear gaping need for us to change there. And I think Maury Goldman and Jose Wezar give a really robust legal argument if there's any challenge there. And for items three and four, I think it's preferable for the city to get its act together and advance its own proposal to the voters, but it's too early to weigh in on whether or not the state should be considering its own action. We've seen past councils drag their heels, and we haven't heard about what this council plans to do moving forward when they get the report. Are you gonna appoint a charter commission? Are they gonna have the authority to put something directly on the ballot? Is there a process where we can get a more independent commission to actually deliberate on this? Uh, if you're gonna keep this in council, how are you gonna ensure there's a rem more robust public input process? I hope you touch on that subject in your discussion of item two, and I hope you also consider how we can get a hybrid LAUSD, LA City Commission, so we don't duplicate work and we save some money 
and focus attention where it needs to be. Thank you for your time. Thank you, speaker. Next speaker, what item would you like to speak on? All available items, please. You have two minutes, go ahead. Yes, hi, Line Namaris on CD6. For item one, I'd like to thank Councilmember Raman for taking the lead on, on um, transparency. Um, for item one, the public deserves transparency and deserves to know if a lobbyist is speaking before a neighborhood council, commission, or city council. The city council has twice led lobbying reforms brought forth by the ethics commission. Die and the municipal lobbying ordinance has not been comprehensively updated since 1994. And as a and I'm speaking as an individual, as a board member myself, and from Sun Valley Area Neighborhood Council, it is important for me to have transparency from everyone. Um, and it's very important because we work really hard trying to push this forward. And I want to give a shout out to Jamie York for her hard work. I want to thank Councilmember Raman, and I'd like to thank Rob Pond for his advocacy work. And, um, and I hope you will pass this item one. Please pass it, do the right thing. And for item two, I believe strongly that that we, the city council, and the, should do more to be independent at, and enforcing an uh, independent resisting commission to have uh, transparency and honesty. Because we don't want a repeat from from what Nuri Martinez did with other council members. We want accountability and honesty and redistricting. And um, I just want to. Um, conclude my comments by saying that please do the right thing because it's been a struggle. Thank you so much. I yield my time. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, what item would you like to speak on? Hi, my name is Jamie York and I'm representing the Reseda Neighborhood Council. I have a CIS that we filed and I also would like to do my own individual comments. You're only allowed to speak on the items today, but are there particular items you'd like to speak on? Uh, uh, I'd like to... It, it, Ms. York, it, you can go ahead and present your uh, community impact statement. You'll have uh, five minutes for that. Um, and then what I'd like to do is ask if you could do that first, please. And then you can take your up to two minutes to speak to the agenda items on uh, your personal time as well. Thank you very much, Council President. All right, so I'll try to make it quick, but the Reseda Neighborhood Council supports changes to the municipal lobbying ordinance regarding neighborhood councils, but we also request consideration of changes to a few minor areas of the MLO that we feel will benefit transparency in the city, and many of those changes are addressed by the Ron and Bonin Amendment. Um, lobbyist disclosure currently for neighborhood councils is only required for written communication. But we believe that the ordinance should be updated to include the same disclosure when a lobbyist makes an oral presentation or a public comment to a neighborhood council that's related to their lobbying efforts. Um, as you may be aware, neighborhood councils have continued to meet telephonically due to COVID, and it's widely expected that we'll continue to do that in at least some form, even when the pandemic passes. But under AB 361, we're prohibited from acquiring speaker cards, which is where traditionally lobbying disclosures have happened in the past. While Reseda can require a disclosure for its own meeting, that disclosure has no teeth for enforcement as it's not an ordinance and it doesn't address the other 98 neighborhood councils, which similarly serve as elected bodies to the city. We believe that the lack of oral lobbyist disclosure required at least many neighborhood council members in information disadvantage and that it should be addressed for the following reasons. One, transparency. We believe every voting member at a board has the right to know if a lobbyist is speaking. Two, diffusion of responsibility. A lobbyist may send a correct written disclosure, either via mail or email, but often those communications do not go to every single board member. So unless the board member is diligent in passing along those communications, that it's possible that there would be a disclosure that other board members don't know about. And then three, lack of training. We do not receive training on identifying or looking up lobbyist activities in the city through the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. We believe that the legal onus should be on the lobbyist to be as upfront and straightforward with the board as possible. And additionally, their responsibility is then on the paid lobbyist rather than the volunteer board member when it comes to the pursuit of this information. But in addition, Rosita would like to request a similar lobbying disclosure for city council and committee meetings. The announcement could either be done by the lobbyist or by the presiding officer of the meeting in order to ensure that the public is fully aware of the associations of all speakers who are paid lobbyists. 
Neighborhood council members frequently listen to city council meetings or recordings of the meetings, just as I know many are doing right now. And we strongly feel that this minor addition would bring greater transparency to the city processes, and we urge the city to adopt that change. Lastly, the Reseda Neighborhood Council urges the city council to adopt a nonprofit exemption of at a maximum 200,000 in revenue or 500,000 in assets instead of the proposed 2 million. Uh, this change aligns with IRS tax filing systems and would allow any nonprofit that files a 990N or a 990EZ to gain exemption. That change is also reflected by the current San Francisco ethics ordinance. Um, the current recommendation of 2 million in revenue is far too high and would exempt the vast majority of nonprofits in Southern California. Only 16% of Southern California nonprofits have revenues above 1 million, so an exemption set at twice that amount would have a grave effect on transparency. Uh, that, passed tra uh, that passed unanimously on my board, um, and I'm ready to do my personal public comment when you're ready. Thank you, go ahead. All right, so first I would like to thank uh, Council President Kokorian for scheduling this item, and Council Member Rahman for her advocacy on this item. Um, about a year ago, I attended a neighborhood council meeting where a high paid lobbyist was presenting and none of the members of the neighborhood council knew that he actually represented the concrete industry. I used my public comment to inform them that he was a lobbyist and they ended up opposing the measure. But 12 days later, I got an email from an ethics investigator and was told that someone had reported me for being an unregistered wood lobbyist. I'm not, I was cleared, but I think a lot about the chilling effect that that retaliatory action could have had on almost anyone else. So I started talking to other neighborhood council members and I realized that my experience was not unique and that the answer was an updating the municipal lobbying ordinance which this city has ignored for almost 30 years. And one by one, neighborhood councils took a stand to fix the city. Pass the MLO with the Raman Amendment. Do not water it down. There is a mandate from the people. 45 separate neighborhood councils at 45 Brown Acted meetings, hundreds of neighborhood council members have weighed in on this. And in most cases, it is unanimously passed at those neighborhood councils. Think about the enormity of that. We all want this, and the city needs this. And I would like to say that part of the motivation for neighborhood councils to weigh in on this is because we actually saw what happened with the next item, number two, how independent redistricting, which was a, a Raman Krikorian uh, motion, was just sat on by the council president. And so neighborhood councils knew that in the Nuri council president environment, ethics reforms, reforms of government, they didn't go, they didn't go anywhere. They just Thank died you, in the committee. So that's why so many of us Thank you, speaker. Your time expired. Thank you. Next speaker, what item would you like to speak on? Um, yeah, I will speak on all of the items. You have two minutes. Go ahead. Perfect. I'm also speaking for uh, JAS for Palms. Um, I could probably get it all done in three minutes, but I'll try to aim for two total. Is that okay? and the same orders before the CIS and then my personal statement. That'd be great, thank you. Perfect. Um, first off, thank you so much for scheduling this today. Um, anytime you have an ad hoc committee and a special meeting, it, it's obviously special, right? As, as it was mentioned. And it's important to thank everybody, including all of the council members for showing up um, to provide quorum and to come in and listen today to what's going on. Um, this ordinance, it, it, by the way, my name is Josh Nadell. I'm from the Palms Neighborhood Council. We passed this um, motion um, unanimously at RNC, and we thought it was very important, and that's why we made sure that I would be able to, to attend today and that I was alerted about this. Um, we have a lot of land use issues that come up, and there are a lot of people who are paid a lot of money to make sure that those things get the votes by whatever means necessary. and. Oftentimes that can mean trying to deceive people. And that's not just, as, as Jamie just mentioned, that's not just at the neighborhood council level. And that's why the uh, amendment from council member Ramon is so important. It's also at um, commissions and committee meetings and, and even the city council meetings, they'll, they'll come in and try to take you guys out. 
And, you know, we just, we need to have some more teeth in these measures to make sure that people are just acting in good faith. I mean, I feel that it's important that we all feel that people are, are saying truthful things and they're being honest about who they are and, and what they represent. And that's, that's super important in this case. So with that, I've finished my CIS and I will make my personal statement. Um, first, I want to thank Jamie York for all of her good work on this. It's really hard to, to do these things and it's super important. Um, I personally am the co-chair of a work group that the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners put together last year. And we've been working on something for virtual governance for over a year. And you know, she said that she's been working on this, I think, for a year, year and a half. I, I can appreciate anybody who, who does that. And I think that it should be applauded that she did all this work. And I um, encourage you all to, to schedule this today. And I, I hope that you all can find um, the time and the effort to, to support people in the Neighborhood Council whenever um, we have a, an interesting project of this size. Because as you can see from 45 people coming out, I mean, I put on the town hall about um, CISs last year. I think it was two years ago, we had 700 total. I don't remember the number offhand for last year, but 45 versus 700 two years ago, is, that's like crazy. Um, and effectively, the whole city is saying that this is super important. So again, just want to thank you all for your time and um, your, your ability and honesty in listening to us and giving us time to present. That's also super important and very much appreciated. And I hope you all have a wonderful day and week. Thank you. Next Thanks speaker. very much. Next caller, please. Next caller. What item would you like to speak on? Hi, my name is Kelsey Swartz, and I'm speaking on item number one. You have one minute. Go ahead. Uh, I want to say thank you to Councilmember Roman for introducing this motion, and thank you, Chair Krikorian, for scheduling this item. I also want to echo the big thanks to Jamie York from the Receiver Neighborhood Council for her stellar organizing around this issue. Updating the municipal lobbying ordinance is long overdue, and we need greater transparency when it comes to the influence of special interests in local politics through lobbyist identification and registration being strengthened. 42 of the Neighborhood Councils has sent in community impact statements, which is nearly half of the Neighborhood Councils and in support of the MLO. And 32 of these Neighborhood Councils have opposed the Ethics Commission's $2 million exemption of 501c3 nonprofit. This threshold is far too high and would create a huge loophole and we can't afford to close loopholes while creating new ones. The same is true for closing the fundraising loophole. Our city currently prohibits lobbyists from contributing directly to city candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. What items would you like to speak on? Speaker Hello. Last for Hello. What items would you like to speak on? Um, this is Glenn Bailey representing the North Regis Neighbor Council. We filed a community impact statement. I do want to also add some personal comments. Sure. If you could please start with the community statement. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Glenn Bailey, President of North Regis Neighbor Council. Uh, the, our community impact statement is on file. It was um, adopted at the March 16, 2022 board meeting. Um, and I'll just read a few sentences. Uh, because the concurrent municipal lobbying ordinance section 48.08.8 only requires lobbyist disclosure for written communications to neighbor councils, the North of Geese Neighbor Council supports an amendment to the ordinance to include the same disclosure when a lobbyist makes an oral presentation or public comment to a neighbor council that is related to their lobbying activities. Uh, prior to taking the above action, the uh, neighbor council was informed of the of a proposed amendment to section 48.11 lobbying disclosure, uh, which is when a lobbying entity communicates either personally or through an agent with a neighbor council or a neighbor council board member on behalf of a client, the lobbying entity shall disclose or ensure the disclosure of its status as a lobbying entity and the entity of its client. And for verbal communications, the disclosure shall be spoken at the beginning of the communication for written communications, 
the disclosure shall be printed clearly, legibly, and conspicuously. I do want to uh, thank the City Ethics Commission, since no one's done that yet, for their work in, in reviewing revisions to the Municipal Lobbying Ordinance and for that being scheduled via the motion and to uh, Chairman and President Kokorian for you know, getting it to committee. Um, and, uh, and yes, and to Jamie York for her work in, in engaging and notifying the neighbor councils on this. Um, I'll do my public comment now. And go ahead. Yes, go right ahead, Mr. Okay, Baker. Go, go right ahead. Okay. You're, you're up to two minutes on the agenda. Great, thank you. Um, with regard to municipal lobbying ordinance, I attended the meeting that was referenced by Jamie York earlier of the lobbyists who uh, misrepresented themselves and the president of the neighbor council specifically used those words that the lobbyists misrepresented themselves, um, you know, as her role as presiding in the perception of the neighbor council. And that is on the recording of the meeting. So that is a clear uh, and intentional effort, an example of a lobbyist uh, trying to mislead a legislative body of this city, the Neighbor Council Board. Uh, with regards to redistricting, so the, there were many points of uh, ground zero of the redistricting uh, process that didn't go well last time. And that's obviously why the motion was introduced. Um, but I can tell you that one of them, one example of that, was the political football used by some of the assets in the San Fernando Valley, specifically the Sepulveda Basin, Pierce College. It was extraordinarily egregious that Council Member Martinez removed her appointee on the last, just prior to the last meeting of the redistricting commission because she did not like that work that had been done up to that point in time as it related to some of the assets in, in terms of the district. Um, the, the work that began in December through that October involved so many people and so many hours of public participation. There's no way a commissioner that joined the last meeting, uh, in this case representing CD6, would have been had the benefit or even had time to listen to all the recordings of all that input in terms of com communities of interest and the other factors that one needs to take in consideration redistricting. So definitely moving forward on, on a redistricting reform that would prohibit that sort of political manipulation as happened last time um, is definitely and would be in the public interest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Speak of the last four digits, 9840. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. My name is Brad Kane. I am president of the Pico Neighborhood Council. And I would like to speak on item number one uh, in my capacity since, uh, as a uh, representative of the Neighborhood Council since we uh, put in a CIS. And then I'd like to speak in my personal capacity. Sure. Uh, may I go ahead? Yes, you may. Thank you. Okay. Um, on August 10, 2022, the Pico Neighborhood Council passed a CIS strongly supporting the municipal lobbying ordinance. And uh, we need greater transparency here. 45 neighborhood councils, which is quite a few for us, most unanimously passed this because regardless of our political point of view, the knowledge of who is a lobbyist because it, it affects the perception of bias uh, is critical. And we've had many people come before us who turn out to be lobbyists, but at the time they're just identifying as stakeholders. Uh, we need uh, training from Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, but the burden always should be on the lobbyists because we are unpaid volunteers who, like Jamie York, the other people who have spoken have donated countless hours to making sure that we have good government in the city. It is critical that the ordinance be amended to make sure that 
there is a nonprofit exemption of only 200,000 revenue or $500,000 in asset, because what we have seen time and again is if there is a loophole, money will find a way through it. Um, I would also say, as is in our thing, that the same procedures, I guess, should apply to the city council and the committee meetings so the public who is watching uh, has confidence in the process. Now, in my personal capacity, I would like to say that since our board has not seen the Roman Amendment, but I have reviewed it, I believe that it matches the intent and spirit of what our unanimously passed uh, CIS asked you folks to do. And I want to commend everybody on the committee, including uh, Council Members Rahman and Krikorian, for scheduling and taking this matter seriously, because I know the easiest path is simply to do nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, what item would you like to speak on? Hi, good afternoon. This is Dulce Vasquez representing Voices uh, a Neighborhood Council, and I'd like to speak on items one and four, and then also um, in my personal capacity as well. Sure. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. First, I just want to thank council members, um, Council President Paul Kikorian and Council Member Raman for their advocacy in this. Um, as part of the Neighborhood Council, I am the vice chair. Um, we want, we have passed a motion and filed a community impact statement on item one. Um, Jamie York, I think, put it most perfectly, so I won't take up much more of your time, but I do want to reiterate that we do not get adequate training from the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment in order to look up um, any sort of lobbying activity um, that is being done in the city or to look up who lobbyists are. So I want to reiterate that. On um, item four, we also um, filed a community impact statement and um, supported it unanimously. I think we have seen um, throughout the last couple of months how important this is. There was another, um, there was another caller who pointed out uh, the, the sort of toggling that happened with um, appointed commissioners um, in the last uh, few weeks of, um, of the process. We have seen how this has worked um, on, the, on the state level with LA County and their redistricting commission. So that sort of meddling, I, I don't, uh, in my personal capacity, um, I do not trust um, that we can do this uh, as a city and that we need some help, perhaps from the state uh, to help us better do this, to increase transparency, to increase um, really confidence uh, from our constituents that we can have a wonderful government that is here to serve people. So thank you so much for, for your time and for scheduling this <clears throat> and for taking such an active role in making sure that our constituents are served. I yield my time. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Hello? Hello, we can hear you, but you're a little bit faint. Okay, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. What items would you like to okay. speak on? Item one? Sure, you have one minute. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Catherine Tattersfield. I am calling in support of item one. I would like to thank Council Member Rahman, uh, Chair Paul Kahorian, for putting this on the agenda. And as other folks have mentioned, uh, Jamie York, who's done a wonderful job of advocating for the Rahman Amendment. As it is, right, we don't want to make any changes to something that has clearly got a lot of public support. You know, you've heard a lot of folks who are a lot better informed than I am as to why they support this. And, you know, I just want to say as a person who's attended a lot of neighborhood council meetings, and I am a community stakeholder on a committee in my community as well, and it's just not fair to expect uh, NC members who are volunteers to be able to identify somebody as a lobbyist who's clearly trying to know keep that from them right being disingenuous misrepresenting themselves all kinds of that stuff you know that's the unscrupulous kind of behavior that nobody wants to see in government right and since there's been so much you know talk about how our redistricting process was tainted i think this is a great step to restore faith thank in the you, public speaker. you know thank you next speaker what items would you like to speak on Hello, uh, my name is Michelle Gallagher. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. I just have a couple comments on um, the remainder of the agenda and uh, a longer comment on item number one. Okay? Sure. Go ahead. And I've got my child in the car with me, and I'm pulled over to the side of the road, so just bear with me. Hopefully, we'll, we will all cooperate. Okay, so regarding items two to three, um, independent redistricting, I think we should start to talk a little bit more concretely about that. I mean, yes, uh, this, the city should be um, the one leading the charge, and I definitely support saying, what are you, what are you talking about to the state? Uh, you just, you know, that the, it's not time for any intervention um, there, but I would just like to say that one element from the redistricting, the statewide redistricting process that I really, um, in composing the committee, that I really w loved was the random draw element and um, holding that publicly. I thought that was just really something that should be essential, and I know it's on your oh, list, no. but definitely keep that. Hold on a second, I'm almost done, sweetie pie. Um, okay, so that's kind of like on the, all the rest of them except for one. And then um, on the item number one, um, I just wanted to, uh, hit home on the point that the place where we are as um, Los Angeles and uh, city government is we have to rebuild trust from scratch. And exemptions for, um, you know, business improvement districts and for uh, uh, nonprofits um, that make $2 million, that is not the way to rebuild trust from where it is now, which is the bargain basement uh, level. So just as a suggestion, like, what I like to think of is what would someone else do as a strategy? Just a second, buddy. Um, so what would, what would the big lobbyists uh, say to themselves uh, when they're asking the questions, well, what are we good, how are we going to lobby without anybody um, knowing that it's us now that there's these new um, regulations? And in the case of um, the $2 million limit, I mean, like, it's very easily, what's easy, what the answer would be. Um, so, uh, so just uh, that kind of thought process, like it, 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 it kind of helps to expired. highlight. All right, thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Next speaker, what item would you like to speak on? Great. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Keith Klein. I'm the official representative today for the Woodland Hills Warner Center Neighborhood Council, who has CIS is on file on multiple items. So I'll take that extra time. And plus, I have general public comment uh, as an individual, and I'll get it all done shortly and try not to be too redundant, other than to give a shout out to Jim York, who works so tirelessly on these issues. Um, anyways, um, to speak to you guys kind of more in a narrative thing because the facts are all out there, I'll, I'll just say, you know, that our neighborhood council, Woodland Hills, has filed a CIS on impartial redistricting issues, and I hope you and your staff will be able to review them. Suffice it to say, the last redistricting for the city council uh, and LAUSD was an unmitigated disaster at so many levels. And we owe it to our fellow Angelinos to fix the system. And you all owe it to yourselves to fix it because you are in the center of it and you need it, you know, to be equitable and, you know, be able to execute on the career path that you've all chosen a public service and uh, you know when it doesn't work um, you all get tarnished too so it's in everybody's best interest to get this fixed um, with regard to the MLO reform update it's long overdue and so needed uh, again you know please read our neighborhood council CIS you know because we have Warner Center uh, we've been so affected by lobbyists uh even earlier than the incident that was related to earlier uh that jamie and others you know and glenn experienced i was there too but even before that you know i've been the victim of it um because you know i chair committees that deal with uh city governance and long-range planning and so forth so 
say I'll come before, you know, my subcommittees to start with. Uh, and uh, the, the loopholes are just so obvious. We've been affected by the lobbyists that come and try to mis mislead us, uh, that don't require them to disclose who they are. And even when they are required, too many try to trick us with every trick in the book, trying to avoid telling us that they are lobbyists in the first place and who is paying them. You know, they really try to mislead us. I mean, a favorite trick is to hide behind what I refer to as the American is apple pie nonprofit. You know, they, they come in with all the, you know, organizations that you applaud in the parades and, you know, open the doors for, and they never tell you that, you know, they're actually being funded by an industry group or, you know, a client that's got a one-off that they're trying to jam through. Uh, so the reform needs to require full disclosure every time they are appearing before a neighborhood council, whether they're appearing before us in person, you know, so obviously we need a verbal disclosure from them. Uh, when they email us, and a lot of these guys, you know, will send us emails, you know, before a meeting and not say who they are, you know, but, you know, advocating strongly for a position. And again, if you're working the issues, you're kind of realizing this kind of comment seems abnormal and where's this person, you know, coming from. And if they show up at a committee meeting, you can try to grill them, but oftentimes, you know, you've just got their correspondences or the phone messages that they leave us on our grasshopper, you know, virtual mail system or whatever. So the reforms need to include, as you've heard from others today, in whatever form and fashion they are reaching out to a neighborhood council, they've got to disclose each and every time who they are and who is actually paying them you know, they can't be hot hide behind the shill organizations. Um, and I also want to say that there's many good lobbyists that come before us who do all the right things now, and they provide valuable information, and they live and contribute in the community, and, you know, they're valuable to us, too. And uh, when the dishonest ones, you know, come before us and, you know, put us ill at ease and so forth. The good guys get tarnished too. So we need meaningful reform with enforceable teeth, which our CIS details and, you know, others have, so I'm not going to be redundant. So, you know, meaningful reform with enforceable teeth helps all of us. And, you know, Moving back to the general comment, um, I want to, you know, give um, a, a shout out and thanks to all of you for supporting, you know, S S16 and 17 to get Sacramento to reform the Brown Act and make neighborhood councils able to function with virtual meetings and hybrid going forward. Uh, because we're certainly not going to be able to do it under AB 2449. And spoiler alert, neighborhood councils in the LA and power, you know, are not prepared for us to go. Sir, sure, that, I'm afraid that's not on our agenda. So comment needs to be uh, limited to the agenda today. So okay. anything else on the agenda well, items? Yeah, I'm good. And as others have said, thank you for moving all these issues forward and, you know, I trust you guys are all going to do the right thing. So, thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Next caller. What item would you like to speak on? Yes, I'd like to speak on item one and I am also speaking on behalf of my neighbor council who has filed a CIS. Sure, if you could please begin with the Neighborhood City Council. Yes, so my name is Lydia Grant. I'm the president of the Sunland Tahunga Neighborhood Council. And I wanna thank everyone for addressing this issue, especially to uh, Council Member Raman and, and Kerkorian for bringing this forward. 
and for any of the council members who are listening to us because a lot of times we feel like we're not being listened to and we really appreciate the opportunity. Also to Jamie York for doing such a bang up job on this. Our neighbor council wrote <clears throat> a CIS in support of all of the changes that received the neighborhood council requested. Um, we feel this is a very important issue. Um, we feel that right now there is such an environment uh, at least what appears to the communities as being a, a, an environment of corruption at City Hall. And we need to be working to make things more transparent. Our neighborhood councils have had to deal with lobbyists who are coming, who are speaking, and then when we realize they're lobbyists, maybe by something they've said or because we've kind of looked them up during the meeting, suddenly they, they clam up or they deny the fact that they are um, this is really important, especially because when you have somebody coming and selling something and, and it's an, ag a per an agenda from an organization without it being transparent, that is not okay. And the fact that um, 45 neighborhood councils weighed in on this, as, as the council members know, this, especially those that have been around for a while, like, like um, Council Member Krikorian, know that this is truly unprecedented. And I'm going to tell you, um, as one of the presidents who attend the President's Alliances of the Neighborhood Councils, um, the Neighborhood Councils are at a point right now where they are ready to stand up. They are happy to work with City Council and get things done, but it, it is time that those are the council members who have been pushing down their Neighborhood Councils, who don't support their Neighborhood Councils, who attack their Neighborhood Councils, that united the neighborhood councils aren't going to stand for it anymore and again i appreciate that you are looking at this as a united neighborhood council um um voice because that voice is going to continue to move forward and again we thank everybody for addressing this issue this is it's really important to the neighborhood councils and it should be important to all the commissions and the city council to bring back a, a an era of trust back into City Hall. And we thank you for agendizing and addressing this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Hi, I'm Jennifer Goody. I have a community impact statement um, from Mid City Neighborhood Council. Sure, you may begin. Great. Firstly, we would like to thank Council Members Rahman and Krikorian and the uh, City Ethics Commission for their leadership on this issue and for scheduling the item, correcting the grave disservice done to Angelinos by former Council Members' failure to act. It is mind-boggling that there have not been significant changes to the MLO since 1994. The fact that over 40 neighborhood councils have taken time to file community impact statements tells you how important this matter is to us and our stakeholders. We believe that transparency, accountability, and closing loopholes, while ever important, are even more important at this moment in time when LA City Hall is synonymous with government corruption. We need you to do what is right, even if it is against your own self-interest, and show the world that LA's efforts in city governance reform are not just lip service. Los Angeles is the only major city that uses time spent as a measure of whether or not one needs to register as a lobbyist. This criteria is not concrete, hard to verify, and complicated to enforce. Moving to a compensation model would remove this major loophole in our registration requirements. We believe that simplifying the requirements would also benefit lobbyists as nearly half of the enforcement actions over the last seven years have been for failure to register. We also feel strongly that the exemption for 5013Cs needs to be $200,000 in revenue or $500,000 in assets to align with the IRS filing system. This would essentially allow any nonprofit that files a 990N or 990EZ to gain exemption. This change also reflects the current San Francisco ethics ordinance. Their current recommendation of $2 million in revenue is far too high and would exempt the vast majority of nonprofits in Southern California. Only 16% of Southern California nonprofits have revenues above $1 million, so an exemption set to twice that amount would have a grave effect on transparency. Leaving the exemption so high creates a loophole that would allow special interests to create nonprofit front groups to avoid regulation. Business improvement districts should not be exempt from the lobbying ordinance. Business improvement districts are not representative of the community. They were created with the specific purpose of representing a special interest group, property owners and merchants. Bids weigh in on a lot more than the delivery of municipal services. They seek policy change, zoning changes, 
approval of permits entitlements and reauthorization of their bids to allow a bid exemption would further progress the informal caste system as the haves and have nots that is already so present in decisions made at City Hall. We have also seen how a dangerous fundraising loophole can be when it comes to lobbying in City Hall. A lobbyist fundraising, a lobbyist fundraising was key to Council Member Weizar's CD14 enterprise, and both that lobbyist and Weizar have pled guilty for their corruption. Our city currently prohibits lobbyists from contributing directly to city candidates and officials, but that means little when they are able to organize fundraisers, deliver or bundle contributions, and their spouses are able to contribute without restriction. This needs to be addressed and the loophole closed if we are to have a city hall that is not marred with scandal and corruption. Under section 48.08.8 of the current lobby ordinance, a lobbyist disclosure is only required for written communications to neighborhood councils. We believe that the ordinance should be updated to include the same disclosure when a lobbyist makes oral presentation or public comment to a neighborhood council that is related to their lobbying efforts. As there is not conformity in speaker card policy across NCs, requiring an oral disclosure is the only way to ensure transparency in these interactions. Time and time again, we have seen lobbyists take advantage of the current requirements and misrepresent the purpose of their statements. In addition, the Mid-City Neighborhood Council would like to request a similar lobbying disclosure for city council and committee meetings. This announcement could either be done by the lobbyist or by the presiding officer of the meeting in order to ensure that the public is fully aware of the associations of all speakers who are paid lobbyists. Neighborhood council members frequently listen to city council meetings or recordings of the meetings, and we strongly feel that this minor addition would bring greater transparency to the city processes. We urge the city council to adopt this minor change. We would like to reiterate our thanks to the council members and the ethics commission for taking this matter into consideration and implore you to be the leaders that Los Angeles needs and steer us into a new era of transparency and ethics at City Hall. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Speaker with the last four digits, 2478, please unmute yourself. Yes, I'm here. Hello, Speaker. What items would you like to speak on? Uh, I'd like to speak on items two, three, and four, please. Sure, you have two minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Council President Kokorian and members, uh, good to see you this afternoon. My name is Andrew Westall. I'm principal of Bear Demographics and Research and a former city staffer of more than 16 years. Uh, my perspective on these matters is a, a unique one when it comes to redistricting. Uh, I've served in redistricting positions for the city in all three decades of this process uh, that was implemented since the 99 Charter. Uh, first as technical director for the City Council and Public USD Commission in 2002, executive director for the City Council Commission in 2012, and recently as executive director for the LUSD Commission in 2021. Uh, I've also been a key staffer, a contractor for jurisdictions throughout the state with 25 years of redistricting and practical legal experience. Uh, while much of the public and the media, and I'm sure many of you, uh, have a strong perception of this process from the outside, uh, typically painted by some of the more outlandish antics of a few elected officials or commissioners, most folks don't really know how hard a redistricting commission works internally. All of the necessary steps required while navigating the bureaucracy of City Hall and the politics of the members of the council, and then you're still dealing with the mayor, neighborhood councils, nonprofits, and many others who invest themselves in this process. I uh, plan on sending a letter to this committee uh, outlining what I've seen over the years, uh, the changes I would recommend, and how to best to achieve independence and ensure functionality. Uh, for me, the main goal or purpose of this charter amendment should be to separate and remove any relationship between elected officials, including potential candidates and commissioners. And let me repeat that. Uh, the main goal or purpose of this charter amendment should be to separate and remove any relationship between elected officials, including potential candidates and commissioners. One of the strongest examples I know of the possibly a model for this committee is the City of San Diego City Council Redistricting Commission. I followed this process for two decades and it has been fairly admirable, uh, including expanding the City Council from eight to nine members in 2012. In fact, I was one of two finalists for their executive director position in 2021 uh, and ultimately did not get the job due to a lack of experience in San Diego City Hall. Uh, and I think this is a, a sure, uh, thank you for your time and I plan on sending that letter. And thank you, Mr. President. Next speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Good afternoon, Michael Shilstone with Central City Association. Item two, please. You have one minute, go ahead. 
Thank you. We're very appreciative of this committee's work to establish a truly independent redistricting process for the council and LUSD board. To support public discussion and deliberation on this issue, we analyzed redistricting processes used in six other major cities, as well as LA County, which we submitted in a letter to the committee. Overall, independent processes are characterized by one, the absence of elected officials, including no abilities for legislative bodies or other elected officials to amend or approve maps. Two, no powers of elected officials to appoint redistricting commissioners, or at least balanced and distributed appointing powers. And three, empowered citizen involvement and authority over the process and the incorporation of lotteries into appointment processes. We're committed partners on this, as well as to broader LA city governance reforms, including improving representation, establishing clear remedies for officials who are unable to do their job, balancing powers between the mayor and city council, and enhancing the planning, development, and transportation approval process. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Next speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Speak with the last four digits, 7208. What items would you like to speak on? Speak with the last four digits, 7208. Please unmute yourself. Hi there, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Um, thank you so much. My name is Olga Lexell. I'm currently the organizing director of a nonprofit. And in a past life, I also served in the neighborhood council system. Um, I'm here to talk about actually as somebody who is on the other side of this equation as a potential lobbyist. You know, the last few years as an advocate for various causes through my nonprofit, um, I haven't made any money and I haven't qualified as a lobbyist. But as we grow and we start to raise money and, um, I, you know, as we look at making careers out of this, I think everybody at our nonprofit agrees that this would be good for us even if we might have to be considered lobbyists moving forward. Um, for me, as a potential future lobbyist, I don't see any downside to this. I mean, I'm not afraid to tell people what I'm doing in my professional advocacy work, and I don't think any other person who does this stuff should be, unless you think that you're per personally doing something shady. So I fully support the entire overhaul of the municipal lobbying ordinance. Um, I applaud everyone who's worked on this, and I in particular support the Raman Amendment. Um, I do think that the two million threshold is way too high. Um, again, I, I'm with a nonprofit that I don't think will ever make you know, $2 million a year, but we might make 200,000 or even 300,000, um, which I think is the, the status for most nonprofits. And I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that most of us um, would be happy to see more of this kind of transparency uh, in our field. So um, please, please, please do support uh, the motion in item one as well as the Raman Amendment. Uh, thank you so much. I yield my time. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, what item would you like to speak on? Hi, this is Carolyn Gian Park. I would like to speak on items one and two. I am a governing board member of the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council. <coughs> sure, if you could please begin with the Neighborhood Council comments. Yeah, I'd like to thank um, oh, council members. I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, are you presenting ACIS on behalf of the Neighborhood Council? Correct. Okay. Then um, go ahead and start with that, please. And then if you would like uh, additional time for your personal comment, that's fine. I will just uh, note uh, to those who are still on the line, we still have, um, I think, 10 or 12 speakers. So if we use the, if everyone uses their, their full community impact statement time among those callers, uh, it's going to be a while yet. So um, I'm going to try to get through as many as we can, but if we could be as expeditious as possible, that'd be great. So sorry about that. Just go ahead with your community impact statement first, and then you can go to your, your own comment. Uh, a lot of people have already said um, the point that, um, that, uh, um, we, that the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council is concerned about. Um, I want to thank Council Members Raman and Kukorian for your work on this issue as well as the, uh, your staff and the City Ethics Commission. Um, so I just want to say from experience, 
um, being on the uh, planning committee of Silver Lake Neighborhood Council, there are there are people who call in um, on behalf of developers, and I don't know who they are, um, but it's pretty apparent that, that the developer got them to call in. So um, this is very important. Um, development, uh, you know, is a is a, a complicated issue. Um, we all we all know that there's a lot of um, corruption and a lot of problems around this right now, and ha there has been for many many years. So um, I, uh, the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council um, did unanimously support um, the CIS for item one and the, the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council also uh, unanimously supported item two. Um, it, it's not, we're not listed as a four um, neighborhood council. There, it, it looks like there are many neighborhood councils that were not listed as four even though they did submit CISs. Um, and I just want to note that the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council also suggested amending it to include that um, the, the city council should be expanded. Um, and then that was an, uh, unanimous as well. Uh, and then on a personal note, I, I agree that um, there should be no exemption in, um, for item one uh, with respect to business improvement districts. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Next caller, please. Next caller. What item would you like to speak on? Yeah, I'd like to speak on item number one. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks for everybody for their time today. My name is Christopher Huja. I'm speaking on my own behalf. I am also a board member of the Tarzan Neighborhood Council. Um, just to keep things simple and quick here, there's an overwhelming consensus on supporting the Raman Amendment. We need more teeth, more transparency, and we're all volunteers. We don't have that training. Like, you know, Jamie, Jamie York has done an uh, amazing job in bringing this to the light of everyone. The burden must be on the lobbyists. And, you know, we should know if a lobbyist is speaking before us. We have an obligation to protect our city from lobbyists that have no intention of making Los Angeles a just and equitable one. You know, to purposely mislead people and mislead neighborhood councils, you know, this is a, a basic thing that we need to come together and uh, stop this. And I'm just gonna close by saying, the lobbyists, they have to disclose when they're communicating with us as a habit and as a practice. Thank you for everyone's time today. I really appreciate it and all the neighborhood councils who are here uh, communicating all of this. This is almost 50% of the entire neighborhood council system in LA. I'm getting over a cold, so you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. You too feel better. Uh, next Thank caller, you. please. Next caller. What items would you like to speak on? Speak with the last one. Uh, yes, can you uh, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank well, you. Would you like to uh, speak Star Six did not work earlier in this meeting. My name is Gary Fordyce, and I am in support of council file. And by the way, I this is item one. Sure. And I'll start again. Yeah, uh, yeah. You didn't instruct me what you wanted me to say. My name is Gary Fordyce, and I am in support of council file 22-0560. Specifically, recommend, recommendations from the Ethics Commission and additionally the amendment from Rahman and Bonham. Neighborhood councils are mandated to comply with ethics and funding. Training, yet, lobbyists are permitted to mislead, misrepresent, and manipulate the expenditure of public funds by these very same neighborhood councils. City Council members, you cannot have it both ways. If neighborhood councils must comply with ethics, this manipulation must end. If it does not end, mandated ethics for neighborhood councils is a fallacy. I urge your support. 
A special thank you to the Ethics Commission, Council Members Rahman, Bonin, and Krikorian, and the impassioned advocacy of Dan, Jamie York. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Next caller, please. Next caller. What items would you like to speak on? Hello, uh, item number one, please. Sure, you have one minute. Please go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Sean McMorris. I'm with California Common Cause, and uh, I'm calling in to uh, uh, support the uh, Robin Bonnet uh, motion. We, I also want to thank the uh, Ethics Commission and their staff for uh, continuing to consistently put this matter on the front burner. We, uh, California Common Cause, is supportive of much of what they are proposing. Um, however, we do believe that the uh, Raman Bonin uh, amendments will significantly improve um, the update to the MLO, so we would ask that you please consider them. And we're looking forward to continually engage on this matter as it moves forward. Uh, and just uh, one last thing I'd like to note is that as a sometimes lobbyist under the current LA law, um, I want to note that the LA Ethics Commission and their staff have always been very helpful to me when I had questions about um, my obligations under the law. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller, please. Next caller. What items would you like to speak on? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, calling for the Lake Balboa Neighbor Council Community Impact Statement, uh, and it's on item number one. Uh, I'm Linda Gravani, President of the Lake Balboa Neighborhood Council, and for identification purposes only, I'm also Chair of the Valley Alliance of Neighborhood Councils, which include all 34 Valley Neighborhood Councils. Today, I am speaking as president of Lake Balboa Neighborhood Council on behalf of our approximate 50,000 stakeholders. Our city of Angels is getting the reputation of being a corrupt city, with elected officials now in jail or being investigated by the FBI for playing favorites to their special 501c3 charities, lobbyists, and developers. These changes to the lobbying laws and updates to the municipal lobbying ordinance are long overdue. Why? Why is it so long overdue? Could it be because of the strong and powerful lobbying groups? Why are the lobbyists fighting so hard to oppose these changes? Is it because it's good for the people of LA or because it will benefit them? Neighborhood councils are advisory to LA City Council. And from the 45 supporting uh, these the passage of this council file, we are advising that these changes are to be supported. Think about it, 45 neighborhood councils are representing approximately 50,000 people. That's 2,250,000 stakeholders. Our neighborhood councils are looking out for our communities. The lobbyists are looking out for their jobs. We volunteer, they get paid. Why would they want to misrepresent themselves? Why do they need to be sneaky? We highly recommend that you pass the, these changes uh, in the Raman Bonin Amendment. And I thank you so very much for listening to us today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your service. Next speaker, please. Next speaker. What item would you like to speak on? Speaker with the last four digits, 6710. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, Hello. I'm calling in. Hi, I'm calling in to support item one. Sure, you have one minute. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. I'm just calling in to support the Rumman Amendment and just to implore City Council to please not water down this amendment. It, there's so many good things in it that just help so many important issues in neighborhood council meetings and city council meetings. Everybody deserves to know whether a lobbyist is speaking before a city council meeting. <laughs> we can prevent special interest groups from having an outside say in these issues. And also, I'm just so glad that in this amendment, like business improvement districts count as 
lobbyists because they're basically the property owners and merchants. I don't see them as like normal, regular constituents like myself. Um, there hasn't been any real meaning lobbying with them until re recently, and I just want to thank um, Council Member Amin for um, putting forth this whole thing. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Please don't water down this amendment. It's so good exactly the way it is. I really, really am so happy that like the BIDs will count as also lobbyists in this. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Next caller. What items would you like to speak on? Hello? Hello? Hello. What items would you like to speak Hi, on? Today? Item one, please. Sure, you have one minute. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Dana Cohn. I am a attorney in the city of Los Angeles. I also live here. I am not representing any neighborhood council. I'm reaching out to talk about the cost of basically ethic violations for the city. It is expensive to prosecute or defend cases civilly, particularly ethics cases. Look at what happened with Jose Wezar and the related cases. I, I represent cities in litigation, and while I, have, I do not represent the city of Los Angeles or anything, I can tell you it would be much, much cheaper to have the MLL passed than have the city pay its attorney fees and costs related to these lawsuits. That money can then be better spent on other things such as training police officers, better roads, more outreach programs to homeless individuals. Uh, therefore, passing the MLL will lead to a stronger, more effective city government. Thank you. And uh, please look at how many people showed up on a work day to speak on this issue. I mean, this isn't the evening. This is midday. People are taking time out of their day. Thank you so much. And I actually have personal contact uh, with council members Kerkorian, Blumenfeld, Park, and Raman. And uh, I'm not speaking in any form for them, just on my own as a private citizen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next caller, please. Next caller. What items would you like to speak on? Hello, this is Doug Everhart. I am the president of the Coastal San Pedro Neighborhood Council and I'm calling on behalf of the council to say that we did adopt a motion back in August in favor of this item one, which is what I'm speaking on, and also the amendment regarding nonprofit organizations. That's basically all I wanted to say other than one thing that I haven't heard anybody talk about, and that's the fact that it's very important for lobbyists to identify themselves in our meetings, not just for the board members, but to provide transparency for all of our stakeholders so that they know who is being represented. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Next speaker, please. Next speaker. What item would you like to speak on? Speaking with the last four digits, 0081, what item would you like to speak on? The speaker, are you there? Go right ahead, please. Can you hear me? I'm here. There we go. Hello, Sorry speaker. about that microphone problem. I do apologize. No I'd like problem. To on all available items. Sure, you have two minutes. minutes. Go right ahead. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is James Askew. I have served on the NoHo Neighborhood Council for seven years. I'm here solely in my personal capacity to offer my unequivocal support for Councilmember Rahman's motion to close loopholes in the MLO. As a longtime member of the NC, I want to start by saying I support everything that is in the NoHo NC Community Impact Statement on the MLO, which mirrors the one that Jamie York read into the record said earlier today. On a personal note, I want to say Neighborhood Councils deserve to know when lobbyists are speaking to us. The MLO as written only requires disclosure in written communications, and I know personally for a fact that we have had lobbyists come to, pre to present to us without disclosing their role in the past seven years. We have no training or support from Dunn to help us identify lobbyists or even to investigate them. A citywide standard for all neighborhood councils will help us all serve our stakeholders better. I'd like to thank Council Member Rahman for her leadership and Council President Kokori for scheduling the item. I'd like to thank the Ethics Commission for their work on this, and I'd like to give special daps to my dear friend Jamie for her tireless advocacy on the issue. 
Uh, regarding items two, three, and four, I just want to say, again, on a personal level, I wholly endorse a truly independent redistricting commission that is devoid of any ties to current or future elected officials. I would actually go a step further and call for a new set of maps for the city, given the manipulation of the last redistricting process documented by the LA Fed tape. And I finally just want to say that I unreservedly support expanding the city council to more fully represent all Angelinos. I yield my time. Thank you. What else would you like to speak on? Uh, my name is Wayne Williams, and I'm going to speak briefly on items one and two. I'm a uh, board member, an unpaid board member as well, of the California Clean Money Campaign, and I'm representing the campaign in this call. Um, I act as an advocate for the community, well aware of the overreaching influence of money in politics. Like myself, many of our volunteers invest in time is currently judged in the same way as those who can literally dial up influence in just a few moments with a phone call or a brief meeting. As such, the CCMC agrees with both the Ethics Commission and Councilwoman Rahman that our MLO requires significant change to avoid the undue influence of money in politics that was clearly exposed last year in the audio tapes. We su strongly support Councilwoman Rahman's updates not to exempt business uh, improvement districts and instead seek a prohibition on lobbyist fundraising and delivering of contributions, thus tightening ethics laws. And on item two, we also support independent redistricting. We appreciate the work of Council Member Rahman, Council President Corian. You guys are doing a great job and we urge the committee to support a new powerful MLO and redistricting. And finally, I'd just like to say I am so proud of all of the citizens who are calling in on a day like today to ask for your support and making Los Angeles a good government city again. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker, what items would you like to speak on? Hi, good afternoon. Scott Mandel, president of the Studio City Neighborhood Council. I'd like to talk about our CIS item one and a little personal flavor after it. I'll be brief. Thanks, Scott. Go ahead with your CIS first. Thank you. Um, the Studio City Neighbor Council unanimously, unanimously supports uh, the agenda item one, and we echo what you heard from uh, my colleague, Jamie York. So I'm going to spare you reading the entire CIS, other than thank you all for being here, and thank you, Jamie, for your tireless efforts on this. For my little uh, flavor that I want to add to this, we have nothing against lobbyists, lobbying firms per se. However, when we're up against a trained and compensated professional appearing before a neighborhood council of unpaid volunteers, it only makes sense that they tell us who they are and who they represent. So right now, City Hall, as we all know, doesn't have the best reputation at the moment. So injecting a little bit of sunlight into the process will only help. So I would ask if there's anyone who is in opposition, we haven't heard one yet, why the need to operate in secrecy unless they themselves are a lobbyist, lobbying firm, or lobbyist employer. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good day. So long. Thanks, you too. Next speaker, please. Next speaker. What item would you like to speak on? Speaker with the last four digits, 6675. What item would you like to speak on? Hi there. Um, I was just calling from um, the, the neighborhood council area over here in Mid City. Um, I really disagree with everything that the city council has been doing lately with the mandatory vaccines. That is actually a war crime and it is actually illegal. To okay, do so, so that it's not on our agenda. If you can speak to our agenda items, please, you, you can have up to two minutes on the agenda items, but that's it. All right, well. That's illegal, and you can't limit my freedom of speech, so that's like a constitutional right. And everything you guys are doing is like not for the people at all. You guys are just funneling money, money to wherever you want. There's homeless people everywhere on the street. Okay, you're and not on the agenda, so I, it, stick to the agenda or else I'm going to go yeah. to the speaker. You want to speak to the agenda? Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next caller, please. Mr. Chair, there are no more callers on the queue. 
Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who uh, called in. That was um, a lot of public comment and a lot of community impact statements. So I especially want to thank the neighborhood council uh, board members for the hard work that they put into this. Um, so let's uh, go first item number one. Item number one. Motion, Raman Bonin, relative to the city's lobbying law and city ethics commission report relative to updates to the municipal lobbying ordinance. Very good. Um, so if we can, why don't we hear, um, did, would the ethics commission like to, to start us off with this discussion by giving an overview of uh, their recommendations and then we'll go to Ms. Raman and begin the discussion that way? Sure, President Krikorian. Um, I'm David Tristan, the Executive Director of the Los Angeles Ethics Commission, and joining me are our Commission Board President, Jeffrey Dar, um, our Deputy De Deputy Executive Director, Heather Holt, and our Director of Policy, Tyler Joseph. Uh, first of all, President Krikorian, I want to thank you for taking this item up so quickly once you took leadership of uh, this committee. This, As you have heard from many of the comments from the public, this the lobbying ordinance has not been comprehensively changed in over, since 1994. Two previous attempts um, were not heard. And so we are at the commission are excited for you um, to move this item forward and for council member Ramos leadership on this also. Um, I will keep my, my introductory comments about our recommendations short since you've heard many of them already through the comment, but we believe that these recommendations are key in continuing to strengthen, strengthening the program that we have while Los Angeles has continually been a leader in many of the ethics er, um, areas, we, this is one, unfortunately, where we have lacked. And uh, there are key components to our recommendations that we feel will make uh, the laws stronger um, and really provide much more transparency and accountability of those that make up our recommendation involved uh, changing the definition of who qualifies as a lobbyist. For many years, the city had a definition that incorporated a monetary based definition um, in 2007 that was changed by lobbyist organizations to one that was based on an hourly threshold versus a monetary threshold um, and the prior attempts that we have made at changing our ordinance uh, involved um, changing that back to what it previously was we are in terms of top 10 cities we are the only yeah. city that measures it based on hours versus compensation um, and most of those cities had taken the lead prior to their, uh, to their uh, inception of uh, our monetary best compensation. So that uh, is one of the key components. Generally speaking, the other recommendations deal with disclosure, transparency, um, and how we treat uh, 501c3s and bids. And it also incorporates um, uh, a requirement for neighborhood councils of when lobbyists are seek are speaking before them or transmitting communications to them so they are made aware of who is advocating on whose behalf. Uh, with that, I'd be more than glad to answer any questions that you have. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, Councilmember Roman, do you wanna be heard? Yeah, I'd love to just say a couple of words to kick yes. us, kick our discussion off if that's all right. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Council President Krikorian for uh, for agendizing this so quickly. Um, I really am grateful for that. Uh, and I wanted to start by thanking the Ethics Commission for their service to the city of Los Angeles and really for putting together such a thoughtful and necessary set of improvements to the municipal lobbying ordinance. And I think it's, as you said, uh, David, I think it's really gonna help us figure out who qualifies as a lobbyist um, and really clarify that and help us understand that. And I think making these changes really, will really help us get to a place where we are developing greater trust in our city government and particularly around how we're making decisions in the city. Um, and I think the, the change definition of a lobbyist is really one of the things that it's gonna help us do is gonna make enforcement of the ordinance more possible. Um, and I think that the closure of the, of the loophole um, around lobbyists attempting to influence city officials by arranging gifts for them directly, I think that, 
that's again a really important prohibition that we haven't that we haven't implemented, and I think it's really uh, important to do so at this time. I will be honest with you that when I first started researching this issue, um, and this came, you know, as you heard earlier from all these neighborhood councils who were up in arms about this and the work of, 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 of nonprofit organizations that are out there talking about the need for fostering greater transparency. And I really want to thank their leadership for bringing our attention to these issues and for keeping our attention on them. And I heard from a number of neighborhood councils that are in my district um, and really want to thank Jamie York for her leadership in bringing this to so many different neighborhood councils and getting there. Um, support for these changes. But when I first started looking into this, I couldn't believe that the commission had sent recommendations multiple times to the city council to reform the ordinance to keep pace with times, to keep pace with, with how things have changed here in LA and how things work in LA. And the council never agendized it. And so, you know, to me, I think this is the time to take action and I'm really, really excited that we're doing it now. We're giving the public more of a window into what happens at City Hall, about how decisions are made, about who's influencing those decisions. They have a right to know. Um, and I feel like there is no clearer moment, uh, no more urgent moment for us to take action than right now. And, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we're gonna have today. I know it's gonna be rich. I'm excited to hear from all these people who've raised their hands. Uh, and thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, council member. And just, you know, very briefly, uh, because a number of people have meant to, mentioned the agendizing part of this. Uh, one of the objectives of this committee is going to be to give light to the many proposals around governance reform and ethics changes that have been made over the years that have gone to die in the darkness by never being referred out of the rules committee. And so we've, we've already undertaken a comprehensive review of all motions that have in, in those areas that have been introduced over many years uh, that have, um, have not found their way back out of the Rules Committee. And one by one, gradually, we're gonna be taking up these topics for discussion. Doesn't mean all of them will pass. Doesn't mean you know, there'll be consensus issues at all, but um, we're at least gonna uh, make every effort to, to bring them the light of day. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield. Great, thank you. Um, and again, Mr. President, thank you for bringing this forward. It is long overdue to have these things come to the light of day and, uh, and I'm thrilled to be part of this committee to, to help make those things happen. As you mentioned, we're gonna have to see, see all of these things and how they relate to each other. For example, if we immediately move forward with a redistricting before we've expanded the city council, we may do ourselves a disservice. We need to make sure that we do these things in the right sequence. If we are gonna expand the council, that we, we do the redistricting as part of that so you don't have one and then the other. Um, I love what all the neighborhood councils have said about uh, making sure that people are representing, are being truthful in who they're representing. And I think I, I would, wonder if we can't go a little step further than that and just say anybody who's ever paid a dime to speak at a meeting has to disclose that. Because I'm not only worried about the lobbyists, so to speak, I'm, I'm worried about other folks. Uh, you know, what's to prevent a company or a lobbyist from just hiring a mouthpiece for the one meeting to go speak? Or as I've seen what I, what I believe has happened uh, in, in for, a group opposing a bill of mine a number of years ago, they hire people to come in for, uh, you know, a hundred bucks each to come in and, and, and oppose something or support something. Uh, so I, I don't know if there's, and I, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Tristan about this idea. And, and, and also I want to compliment Mr. Tristan. You've been great about moving uh, these complicated issues and, and putting this forward. And I, I want to thank you and the ethics commission for, for doing the work that you've done. But I want to ask about, um, what if we just, we expanded it to be anyone who is financially compensated or compensated to speak at a public meeting must disclose that before they speak and disclose it orally? Council member, um, I think generally speaking, our commission would support that kind of disclosure. Um, questions that I would pose that, you know, I think should be thought through in this context would be, uh, 
you know, what is defined as paid. There are situations where individuals are bused to commission to council meetings or are given lunch, um, and that might raise some questions for for um, entities that uh, maybe wouldn't even qualify. So maybe something where if if there is a qualification by a lobbyist or a client that might trigger that that might help address those issues. But those are issues that we we ourselves at at the staff level have struggled with because we have been made aware of situations where individuals, especially during the COVID period, were paid um, money to call in when they in fact didn't even live in California. Uh, but you know, recruiting is done where they are paid to call in and say they support or oppose a call with no one ever knowing who they were. But because in many instances they're not proving the 30 hour threshold was very complicated and made it very challenging for us to know. Now in this case, well, you know, uh, the definition might help address some of those issues in terms of dealing with the compensation. Uh, it is, I think, important for the elected officials to know who is speaking before them and whether uh, they are being paid. Um, so I, you know, in terms of our, our uh, the commission, we would not, you know, oppose that kind of disclosure. We, in fact, support it. Well, then I'd like to make that as an amendment uh, to to amend what we have here to, uh, or to have, it, have you report back to give us your definition of how that can work because I, I don't think we're going to approve all of this right now it's a report back but um, I'd like to see that you know ex you know the lobbying definition of who's a lobbyist who's not I'm, I'm all for you know expanding that and capturing in nonprofits but I but I think it misses the point it's not just the lobbyist it's anybody who's paid and, and companies can pay people who are not lobbyists they can pay you know people who seem like average citizens uh, you know, on one-offs, and they can, and we've seen it happen. Um, and they could do that to us, and they can do that to neighborhood councils. So uh, I'd like to have this come back with a, um, a an expansion, a look at the expansion to include anyone who is financially compensated. And, and, and of course, you can put in some sort of a trigger so that it's not impossible to maintain, you know, if, if there's a $20 limit for busing or what, you know, whatever. But frankly, even if people are bussed in, there's no reason why we shouldn't know that. But I, you know, I, I want to avoid the gotcha kind of situation too, where, you know, it's not, and I, and I guess if people are bussed in and we know that that's not going to change my, my view of someone speaking from the heart, but they were bussed in that their viewpoint is still just as valid. So, I, but but no, you know, transparency is so important across the board. Uh, so I like that idea and, and asking to report back. I will say um, I am a little concerned about the recommendation about the lobbyists and contributions. With gifts, I have no issue. Uh, you know, frankly, I'm fine if we just eliminate all gifts to uh, any elected official, but the the issue of contributions um, concerns me on a couple of grounds. You know, one, I don't know how we get around some of the Supreme Court rulings, um, even if we don't like them. They're the, the law of the land at the moment. Uh, so I, I, that may be more of a city attorney question. Um, but, and then the other is, to me, I, I don't know that, it, you know, having a lobbyist connect folks in industries or in interest groups who have an interest in in being involved in the political process through contributions is not necessarily a bad thing. If, I, if I'm doing a lot of animal welfare legislation and, and there is a lobbyist who is in touch with all these animal welfare folks and they want to they wanna direct them and say, hey, this guy's up for election, you should go contribute there, and they want to connect me and those people, so to speak. I don't think that is a bad thing. Transparency is important. Uh, certainly, if, if a lobbyist is fundraising, that needs to be um, disclosed. But I don't know why that's worse than if an industry leader or if a company is fundraising or bundling or those kinds of things. It seems it seems odd to just pick out a a lobbyist in that sense. I understand. Yes, lobbyists should not be contributing because that, in many ways, is like a third-party contribution because somebody is paying that lobbyist and then they're using that money to give it to you. So that is, to me, that is why we have the lobby prohibition. But if a lobbyist is connecting donors to a campaign, 
Um, as long as that's disclosed, I don't see a problem with that. So that's a recommendation I have uh, uh, an issue with. But, but the MLO has got to be updated, and I think that's really important. Um, and a lot of these recommendations are, are really good. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harris Dawson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I want to uh, join in the round of thanks to you and Councilmember Rahman for making sure we got this in front of us in a timely manner. I uh, also want to thank Mr. Blumenfield for his uh, questions. They were some of the ones I had. Wanted to take a slightly deeper dive uh, on a couple of them. And that is, uh, you know, speakers with any financial interests. I, I guess let me stop. By, let me start by saying this. This um, policy in our discussion today um, is, has been done in a way to suggest there are a lot of people out there opposing it. And I just wonder what the opposition is. Who is it that doesn't want to say where they're coming from? Um, and I, I would really love uh, to know that because, you know, just on the nonprofit thing, I spent a lot of time in my life working at a nonprofit. We bust people down. I come down to speak. The first thing out of my mouth is after my name and where I live is I'm from Community Coalition or I'm from La Defensa or I'm from, you know, uh, PETA uh, in the case of animal welfare. So I, I, I just don't get what the big hurdle is around people identifying. And, and my first question is, why is there an exception for nonprofits at all uh, of any budget amount? Uh, frankly, one of the easier things to do is stand up a, a nonprofit organization that has no money. Uh, so I'm curious about what that is. If it's that we don't want to create a financial burden, we can say below a certain budget you're only required to verbally say and not fill out a, you know, not create an administrative burden for them. But I, I'm very curious about why there's an exemption at all. I don't know any nonprofit that would go through the trouble of giving testimony and not want you to know who they are. So I think the issue, first of all, is it's not just disclosure in public meetings. It's also registration and all that comes with registration and the many you know, the minefield for the unwary that comes from all of that. But um, uh, Mr. Tristan, would you like to speak to that or or Mr. Dar? And I want to take a moment also to recognize and thank uh, Ethics Commission President uh, Jeff Dar, who is here as well and who has put many, many years of work into not only this ordinance, but everything else that the, the commission uh, has been doing. So um, w would either of you like to respond to Mr. Harris Dawson's point? Uh, yes, uh, Councilmember uh, Dawson. The, uh, my comment was in terms of what uh, President Kokoria mentioned and a situation where uh, registration might be required since that was one of the issues that the nonprofits that spoke um, the many times that we had uh, meetings on this uh, was in terms of th uh, thresholds uh, that, uh, that are challenging for them in terms of having to register a report. Uh, in terms of m making comment at public speaking, no. I mean, we could come up with a proposal that wouldn't be tied to registration or anything at all uh, as, as the report back. So absolutely, we, would, uh, we could do that. And can, uh, President Dar, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything to that. Sure. So uh, the issue of any exception amount gears to what is the burden that on nonprofits, and we're trying not to, you know, to balance things. Um, I will just share that uh, this is the third effort by the Ethics Commission, the first one while I was uh, on the commission, uh, to try to get any changes to the MLO done. And you know, everyone knows 2008, 2018, the silent death of two years. So when we approached it this time around, we formed an ad hoc committee, I'll just share the following. Uh, one, uh, I was on the ad hoc committee with the then president of the commission. Uh, second, very intent that this time around, we had to get a package together that hopefully would at least have a hearing versus nothing, silence. What that meant was we attempted after a lot of public comment uh, to get a broad support proposal and one that we thought would gain traction for where we are today and also get unanimous support from the Ethics Commission, which is five different individuals. And so the issue of the exemption amount uh, was one of the ones that was not otherwise unanimous, but to get to a unanimous recommendation so we would hopefully be where we are today and get something done. We agreed on uh, the $2 million amount, 
I will tell you the ad hoc committee report, if you go look at it on page 12, I went back and looked at it recently, uh, did specifically provide that the ad hoc committee, which essentially worked up these recommendations, encouraged the conversation about an appropriate dollar amount for the 501c3 exemption. And so I, I think that's more than fair game here, but I just want to give you that context of how we got to where we are today for purposes of what's before you. And I think it's important to know, and I, I really applaud everyone to actually have a hearing on this and hopefully, most importantly, do something. Uh, silence and leaving the MLO to its original state is just you know, uh, totally unsatisfactory and not an answer for anybody. And the neighborhood council part, uh, as obvious as it may seem today and the support it has, was actually one of the ones that was a little more difficult to work out so that we could get it before you. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Harris Dawson, did? Yeah, did yeah, so, so I guess I, my question, Mr. Dar and city attorney, I suppose, what if there was a, uh, a requirement for disclosure for all nonprofits verbally? And then uh, uh, I, I agree with not creating an administrative burden for nonprofits that are too small. Uh, but that to me is, comes more out of a critique of our, our administrative system in the city, uh, not in terms of its, its efficacy. Uh, those forms are, uh, can be onerous uh, administratively, so I get it uh, why you want to create a, a barrier. But I, I just wonder uh, if you think consensus would be lost if there were a verbal requirement for everybody and uh, and you know what what uh, the legal basis for us to impose uh, such a requirement that would be anybody in terms of um, sort of uniform disclosure yes uh, so I think um, that kind of dovetails on what mr. Bloomingfield was suggesting um, which mr. Tristan spoke to I on that point, I can see where this gets complicated because the, as, as you were both speaking about it, I was thinking of examples that we've had in council where uh, when we did say the plastic bag ban proposal and we started getting, you know, a bunch of employees from so, supposedly employees from plastic bag companies who came to speak. Now, some big company, paying overtime to their employees to come and give uh, comment to council um, and giving them the talking points and saying, here, this is what we want you to say. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I have no way of knowing because none of it is disclosed. But on the other hand, I can see where that gets complicated to, as to when is somebody being compensated for their, their testimony as opposed to, uh, to not. So um, if, if any of you have thoughts on that now, please, um, you know, go ahead. Um, but I do think if there's no objection from members, I think it's definitely a good idea to get a thoughtful report back on how we could be much broader with this disclosure requirement. Um, it shouldn't just be limited to, to lobbyists. Anybody who, you know, is there because they're being paid to be there as opposed to volunteering to be there because it affects them personally, if they're being paid, the decision-making body should know that. So how how we achieve that, I, I'm not 100% clear on, um, because I, I, as I say, I could see where there could be some complexity to it, but but can we at least get a, is, if, there's, if there's no objection to, by anybody, I think we should at least get that report back uh, from Ethics Commission staff um, as to how we can broaden this. Could I? Is that fair? Could I speak? Yeah, Council Member Rahman. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, it, I don't want to jump the queue, but could I just speak to this particular yeah, sure. point? Sure, That's sure, right. sure. Um, I did just want to say that um, I want to, you know, I'm happy to get a report back on this. I do want to um, just say two quick things. One is enforceability. Like what, it, you know, it's really at, at some point, I want to make sure we're not penalizing good faith actors because there's no there's really no capacity to, for us to be able to enforce on bad faith actors on something like this. Um, and so designing the rules in a way that doesn't, you know, disincentivize honesty, I think is, is, is we have to be thoughtful about that. Um, and I just wanna just 
have that in our minds as we go forward. The second is thinking about busing and things like that. I also want to get us to a high enough threshold that we're not penalizing people who couldn't afford to come from like Reseda to City Hall to testify about something without the aid of a bus or something like that. Or, you know, I don't want to get into a situation where if you show up to City Council to give your testimony and you had some assistance in getting there because without that assistance, you may not have been able to come, that you're penalized for that or that your testimony is somehow devalued because you're now a paid protester, you know, about an issue. And yeah. so I just, it's not like, I, I, I think we can design disclosure requirements that take those issues into account, but I just did want to put that on the table that it's expensive to park in downtown LA. It's expensive to own a car. It's sometimes, you know, public transit accessibility in a lot of these places is, a lot of parts of LA city are very, very minimal. So I just want to make sure that if we're providing support to residents of the city who feel strongly about a particular issue to come and give testimony, that they're not somehow devalued because they're labeled as being paid to show up for something because they got the support of getting a bus there. And I know that's not what you were intending, um, Councilmember Bloomfield, but just want to figure out how to structure the requirements in a way that doesn't do that or doesn't even lead to that. And that so, certainly was, since, since you mentioned my name, just, just to remind, respond, that was certainly not the intention at all. And I'm happy to have some exemption for transportation or whatever, however we want to get around that. But uh, I have seen the situation where people have been compensated by companies uh, specifically about legislation. Yeah, like so astroturfing organizations. Astroturfing is a real thing, time. is a real thing. So in as much as we can capture through transparency the broadest net possible without penalizing anyone. That's the idea. And we don't, we, can, we haven't talked about penalties or anything else, but just to be able to say, are you representing somebody if they don't say it and then they have to say it at that point is worth something. So I'm so sorry, Mr. Harris Doss, that uh, we kind of took Thank the floor you. away from you, but um, let's go back to you and let you finish up your train of thought. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And thank you for the discussion. I think it's it's the right discussion to have and it's not simple. Uh, again, you know, as somebody who raised money to get people on buses to come testify, I want them to say who brought them to the meeting. So I don't think it's a penalty at all, but I, I, that's, you know, that's it. Um, that I think depends on from what side of the issue you're looking at it. Um, I, I just, I'm trying to run scenarios where it is a penalty for me to say who I'm associated with. And I, I, I just, I have trouble with that uh, concept, uh, uh, sort of writ large. If, if you have an affiliation and that affiliation helped facilitate you being there or is paying you, just say so. Um, the, the second thing is a, a little bit thornier and uh, far more complicated. And that, that's on this, uh, you know, there's, we have these general categories of people who are in favor or being paid to be in favor of an issue. Uh, but we have other people who have financial interests all the time who show up to oppose things. And that doesn't count, that ends up not counting. So, you know, as a, as a person who's been on the Plum Committee, the, the Planning and Land Use Committee the entire time I've been on council, you often have a situation where one business owner down the block opposes the built some building down the block because their competitors are going to move into it. That person has as much, frankly, more financial interest than the people who are in favor of it. The people who are in favor of it have all these rules that they have to go by. The person opposed to it has virtually no rules. Uh, in fact, they're given even greater legitimacy, legitimacy because they are a stakeholder. They're, they're already a business operator or worker or uh, owner in the, in the area. And, and I just, you know, want to lift that um, and and hear what the thinking is on, on that because the folks opposed to things have as much impact on policy as the people who are for things. In fact, I'd argue in many cases they have more impact. Council, council member, in terms of our current laws um, and the proposals, they they would capture any whether somebody's supporting or opposing a particular measure. The key linchpin there really is 
whether they're being compensated or into the current law compensation and hourly threshold. The difference, and maybe this is what you're referring to, is an, an individual representing themselves where they're not being paid. In that situation, that individual it would not trigger any reporting requirements under us if they're doing it on their own behalf. Uh, and I think probably there may be some First Amendment issues in terms of our ability to uh, limit what they can do. Uh, maybe maybe look we could look at disclosure issues, but it's going to bring us back as to the question of how do we determine that? Do we base it on a monetary threshold? In which case, you know, a business owner isn't going to be paying themselves to speak, or do we base it on something else? It is something we can look at if that's something uh, this commission wants us to look at. But that's, I think for us, that would, would be where the challenge is and when individuals are speaking and representing themselves um, uh, in, on a particular issue. Got it. Thank you. That's it uh, for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council Member Hernandez. Thank you uh, to everybody that has been doing the work and the labor for all these years to get us to this point. Thank you, Council Member Rahman, for putting it forward and Council, uh, Council President Pecorian for agendizing it. I have a few questions. Uh, the first one being, you know, how does this apply to labor that shows up um, to our meetings or that, that shows up to these, these meetings that we're talking about? Um, how does the department plan to do outreach about these changes to make sure that people are in compliance? Um, are we offering any support for our city staff or neighborhood councils uh, to ensure that they understand whether they're being lobbied appropriately or not? And what, is enforce, what does the enforcement process look like and the timeline for that? Uh, council member, I think I got all those questions down. Um, in terms of labor, if, if labor is going and speaking to council on a particular issue, uh, if they're not being compensated, if they're volunteering, if they're doing it on their own time, they will never trigger a registration requirement. Uh, so they will ne would never qualify under the current hourly and uh, threshold and compensation. And obviously if we were to move to a compensation based threshold similarly, so they can, they can communicate um, unpaid uh, to the council or to other elected officials, um, city employees uh, in any fashion, shape or form, and they would never trigger a requirement. Um, in terms of outreach, absolutely, that would be one of the key things we would be doing. And part of why we you know it was important for us to get this item move forward is to uh, clarify and uh, explain to those that are subject to these rules what the rules are. We've started, you know, some some outreach with some neighborhood councils and the Congress of Neighborhood Councils. Part of the outreach for us has also been redirecting many of these individuals back to our website and making them aware of the who is registered as a lobbyist uh, providing dashboards that provide information on lobbyists and the matters pending before them uh, so that would absolutely be part of our plan um, in terms of uh, support of city staff it, it's similar to that we regularly send out information about you know accessing our site but going back to some of the comments made earlier about you know clarifying i think that is one of one of the issues that we want to also help because there's been some uncertainty by nonprofits and other groups as to whether they qualify or not. Uh, we always encourage you know, city employees that if someone communicates with them um, and they're not sure, they can contact our office and we can, we can let you know whether they're a registered lobbyist or not, or we can direct it to our site where we list uh, lobbyists in many ways uh, in terms of alpha or, or subject uh, agency that they're lobbying. There's many ways you can do that. But um, any suggestions that you might have as to something that may be helpful for your office, just let us know. Um, and finally, enforcement. In terms of enforcement, it, it really depends on what aspect we're talking about. Um, currently under the law, the 30-hour threshold has been extremely challenging. Uh, there are individuals that get, based, uh, that get paid based on a project and not on hours. And so documenting, um, and, and when we investigate those cases, it becomes impossible to determine whether they ever spent 30 hours or not because you, we may see some email communications, we may see some phone calls, but it'll be very difficult for us to determine whether we can add that up to meet the 30 hour threshold. So changing it to an hourly threshold will be extremely important. And again, more importantly, to capture individuals that are paid substantial amounts of money, but are spending little amounts of time reaching out to city officials. Um, in terms of the other areas uh, that we enforce, again, key to, key to that part is education and outreach. 
uh, we have spent the last couple of years of sub spending substantial amounts of time doing outreach to every group that may fall under our umbrella. Um, and yet we still continue to have individuals that uh, violate the law and we enforce against even once they are, they are made aware of it. So um, one of the key ways for us to even in those cases determine, you know, whether violations exist, it, it has been communications, you know, from the public or complaints, press stories, um, and our staff looking at uh, council files, at agendas, um, looking at projects that are coming before the council and us not seeing any of those individuals or entities registered. So we will continue to do that um, and uh, n not to, um, you know, be raising the budget issue this early on, but in our upcoming budget request, we will absolutely be making additional requests for, for auditors and investigators to uh, more uh, strongly support all of this work. And let me, let me just tag along. One of the things that everyone should be thinking about, because it's on my mind a lot, uh, whatever type of further transparency requirements we have, what teeth are there so people comply? The goal is compliance, not to do a gotcha, but we don't want to have a system where it's really gotchas. And that gets back in part to uh, you know, the question from Councilmember Harris Dawson of why any uh, exemption amount was in mind. And it's due in part to what do we see a lot of at the Ethics Commission? We see uh, allegations of unregistered lobbyists. And you know we want to be careful that we have people comply with that over uh, standards and rules of disclosure we have, including if it's individuals who are being compensated for attending a meeting. But at the same time, we don't want to have people who are you know, in good faith, innocent, not just aware, notwithstanding all of the outreach and education being subject to aha, you nonprofit didn't register when you should have. So we want to be very careful that we all think about uh, how we balance all that so we get what we want, but at the same time, uh, not make people overly complicated in exercising the rights of uh, free speech. Thank you for that. And yes, as someone who has, who has, to, uh, ad has had to advocate uh, from a nonprofit, I appreciate that. Um, and also it's an equity issue, right? Many nonprofits don't have access to lobbying attorneys uh, or even to like follow that process through. I had, a, you know, it's very complicated. So I'm glad that we're talking about it and I'm glad folks are uplifting equity issues around it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Councilmember Bloomfield, I'll, I'll get to you in one second, but I just wanted to ask one follow up uh, to Councilmember Hernandez's question about labor, uh, because this has always um, been a little unclear to me and, and uh, ethics if you could help me with this there are some entities that hire professional contracted lobbyists there are other entities that have full-time paid professional government relations uh, senior vice presidents uh, on their payroll um, are they treated differently under our current MLO uh, no president Gregory they're treated exactly the same um, if if um, either entity um, spends 30 hours uh, or more lobbying and uh, has a direct communication with the city official and is compensated any amount, that triggers a reporting requirement. So even if it's a big nonprofit and they have a government relations branch, they, they have to register? Okay. Correct. They, they and, have to register. Or if it's a union and they have a full-time advocate on the payroll who comes and works with city council all the time, they have to register as well? They, under the law, they do have to register. Okay, okay, thank you. Mr. And, and just to clarify, uh, yeah. you know, uh -huh. in terms of the, my response to council mem member Hernandez, I, it, it, uh, the, the only scenario where there would be different there is unpaid volunteers doing that right. kind of work. Right, okay, thank you. Mr. Blumenfield. Great, thank you. I appreciate all the discussion and, and Mr. Hernandez, I agree with you, but you know, we need to, Equity-wise, make sure that everything that we're doing is not making it more difficult for people to engage. We want to make it easy for everyday people to engage with our process. Uh, and, and the rule's easy to understand, which is sort of why I go back to if everyone has to disclose if they're being paid, that's a very consistent message. Now, penalties and things, maybe we have penalties for actual lobbyists who are could know better and, and a much lower penalties for folks who are not, you know, being compensated very little or something to that effect. The reason I, I raised my hand was, it was more about uh, 
narrow issue on, on the specifics of making sure we're not in the gotcha phase and that we're in the uh, make a difference phase. On the, the uh, discussions about when we tell a lobbyist that they have to disclose uh, all verbal and written communications, how far does that go? Does that include if if they call you on the phone or if you if you call them on the phone, they have to pick up the phone and say, disclose themselves every time? If you're, how does that work? And how do we avoid, make that real and not a, a gotcha situation? I, in, in terms of the, the, the proposal that, that we put forward that would, um, that address neighborhood councils, it would cover both. The, the communications that we heard from neighborhood councils, they felt that it was important to, that any communication that would happen um, with them uh, should be tracked that way because uh, they their main concern is that they just are not familiar with everyone involved on many of these issues. So felt that they felt that was important. In terms of you know, implementing something at the council level, there there for our offices there are some things that are easier than others. Documenting something in a communication, whether it be an email or in public, is much easier for us to look at, investigate if somebody were to file a complaint um, and determine compliance. A phone call or an in-person type of disclosure, honestly, it is a little bit more challenging. Uh, there's no way for us to be able to track that as we would in something that is documented. And it also might present some challenges, you know, for the elected official in terms of any requirement that may exist that they have to track that in some way. So I think there should be some consideration for that. Uh, obviously, that has to be weighed with the fact of uh, the city official wanting to know who's communicating that you know with them and you know who is comp more importantly who's compensating them uh, to communicate with them but uh, yes uh, council member you know there are there are a little more challenges there with a verbal or a phone call versus an email or a more formal communication or a comment made at a public meeting right so, I mean may, maybe a way to make it cleaner is to say anytime that they that the lobbyist initiates a, a call or comment rather than any communication because then if if you call them back you're not going to expect them to be saying uh, you know on that phone call or if, there, if there's an email back and forth you just want to make I mean it's all about disclosure so correct it may be cleaner and I guess I'd put that as an idea if there's an, unless there's a problem with it that it's just you know, instead of saying communicates, just when a lobbying entity initiates a communication, um, that might avoid some of the gotcha, but make it clear that, that on the upfront, the moment that they sign a speaker card, the moment they stand in front of a group, the moment that they call somebody on the phone, they have to disclose who they are. But the back and forth after that, you, you don't want to get in the gotcha situation. I, I actually had a proposal that I was going to suggest to kind of simplify that, um, which I, I guess I can throw out there there now. Um, but I have to say this came as a, a little bit of a surprise to me to hear um, that this was so much of a, a problem with neighborhood councils because, as Mr. Harris Dawson said, I can't imagine a situation where somebody comes before a council committee and doesn't disclose that they're, you know, representing somebody else. But it makes sense in the neighborhood council context where somebody can just say, oh, I'm a stakeholder. And, the, and you know, what does that mean? We don't know. So um, this is a real problem. And I, I appreciate that the neighborhood councils have, have raised this problem. Um, and as I think a fairly simple suggest, uh, simple solution to that problem. And by the way, it should encompass our, our committee hearings and so on too for the sake of the public. Because even if we know that the person is representing somebody, the public wouldn't unless they're disclosed in that. Yeah. But at the same time, it's, it would be ridiculous if, you know, you have a conversation with somebody in a hallway, you know, somebody that you've been talking to on this topic for three years, that every conversation has to begin with, oh, and I'm representing such and such. So uh, the thought that I had was um, we could change, we could say that anytime anyone presents, or gives public comment or, or makes a presentation to any 
Brown Act or any Brown Act meeting, any meeting subject to the Brown Act, or any time they communicate in writing to any city personnel uh, on behalf of a client, that that be disclosed, that client relationship be disclosed. So all presentations, all public comment, all written communications, um, I think that's that gets at the, you know, at the at the nub of the problem that we're trying to get to, without that continuing problem that you're talking about, where people, you know, it be it, it almost becomes like a, you know, Prop 64 warning, you know, where every place you go, you see that something, you know, inside the building uh, causes cancer, and so nobody pays any attention to any of it anymore. If you had that constant disclosure like that, it it would become meaningless. So, but it is very real that people who are hearing public comment, whether board members or the public, need to know that that public comment is being presented for compensation by somebody. Any, any, I see one thumbs up on that, so that, <laughs> and it comes from Councilmember Raman, so thank you. Um, We'll get, we'll get, we'll come back to that. I've got a couple of other thoughts. Mr. Blumenfield, any, any other? No, no, I mean, that, that was the point. And I mean, this, I don't know if that captures the emails back and forth, but I think it gets close enough, you know? Yeah. Well, I, you know, and again, with an email, how hard is it to just, you know, put it in a footer or something? You know, I mean, it's, if it's in writing, that should be a simple thing. We don't have to worry about the gotcha thing where somebody, forgot to mention it when they were at a Super Bowl party and talked to somebody and oh by the way you know I you know I'm so I, I think any written communication it should be simple enough to comply with and more importantly it should be simple enough for the Ethics Commission to be able to enforce because they have something in front of them that they can look at uh, okay anything anything else on that so um, just a, a few thoughts, uh, and I, I just want to throw some thoughts out there and then see what everybody thinks. First of all, all of this, you know, sort of uh, came to light in the first place because the Ethics Commission has been saying for years that uh, the MLO needed updating. So uh, thank you to the Ethics Commission for your patience in, <laughs> in pushing this forward and, and trying to bring our MLO into the literally into the 21st century. So thank you uh, all for that. And thank you, Ms. Rahman, too, for um, your uh, push to to kick it up a notch and to as, seize the opportunity to, to uh, touch upon some issues that uh, also uh, we, we should address as long as we're doing it. Uh, it seems to me that the um, thrust of what the Ethics Commission has wanted to do um, in terms of disclosure and registration uh, make uh, a fair degree of sense. Um, I, I This discussion about um, nonprofits uh, has been a, a rich one for me because um, my instinctive reaction was to say, well, you know, nonprofits, uh, you know, that's not who we're trying to get at. But the more I thought about that, um, the more that raises real concerns uh, under the First Amendment, it raises concerns about you know which nonprofits are favored nonprofits and which are not favored nonprofits, and I just don't know how we can really get to that uh, in any way that is not going to be um, content based, really. So um, I, I would like to narrow that exception as much as we practically can. And um, so I think uh, one way to do that, if I'm not mistaken, um, they're under the current IRS code, there are some uh, definitions that we could use that would be, um, that we would be able to use to narrow that, except, except that exemption uh, significantly. And um, so let's see, let me get to my notes here on that. Oh, yeah. So what I'd suggest on that is that 
we uh, amend the proposed section 48.03E uh, to read an, organ a, an organization that is exempt from federal taxation pursuant to section 501c3 of the IRC whose most recent federal tax filing included an IRS form 990N or an IRS form 990EZ uh, or an organization whose next federal tax filing is reasonably likely to include an IRS form 990N or an IRS form 990EZ um, would be exempted. And then we strike out the whole section about, you know, the nature of the organization, what it was created primarily to provide, and we strike out the $2 million gross receipts um, section. And um, that will greatly reduce the, um, the number of nonprofits that would be exempted from that. And I think, is, is there somebody from, who, who knows more about those forms than I, who, who can address exactly what that would, would do? I think it's 50,000 and 200,000 would be the thresholds. That is correct, council member. Okay. So that's, that's what I'm gonna suggest on uh, Just that, a clarification. Yeah, I, I I know the 990 form, but I don't know those specific ones that you mentioned. You're saying that that those form the forms that you mentioned refer to or the nonprofits that have a that have a total income of less than fifty thousand. Is that what you're saying? Uh, let I'm going to ask Mr. Tristan to explain that. It's cor correct. Certain organizations that have thresholds of less than fifty thousand and and 250,000, that approach would be similar to what currently exists in, in uh, San Francisco's ethics ordinance. Got it, so it's, they're still filling out, because lots of, every nonprofit fills out a 990, but these are specific 990s that I'm not aware of. That... Cor correct, they would, they're threshold based. So if you gotcha. filed one, then you would be exempt from the um, lobbying ordinance. If you didn't, then you would be subject to the ordinance. Um, and there would be no discussion about the types of services they do or do not provide. Got it. It's simply yeah. based on the comp on the comp the compensation. Right, and and this is a separate and apart discussion. We may still make everyone have to disclose if they're compensated, but this can be a this is a separate track. This is for all the regulation stuff, not not for the disclosure. Disclosure in terms of verbally is, is stating that you are paid. So let well, wait. Let's, let's be clear here. The, what's before us now is the disclosure requirements of registered lobbyists. And we're talking about expanding the definition of registered lobbyists, the registration requirement. What uh, Mr. Blumenfield and Mr. Harris Dawson suggested, which I agree with, is that we come back with an additional report about how we broaden that requirement even beyond the scope of people who are required to register. Did I understand that discussion correctly? From my perspective, yes. yeah, so that we, yes. it, that has That's nothing okay. to do with lobbying registration, it just has to do with this, what we all agree on, which is disclose if you're being paid, simple. Be proud of it, <laughs> be proud of who you're affiliated with. But, and but I, would, stay. I would, I would, and just, to add to this, I would distinguish public hearings from written communication because often the way people learn about an issue is through the public hearing. So the various people that come and say whatever they say, it's how the public informs themselves about an issue. So knowing who's presenting, I think matters a lot. Sorry, could I, yes, could I just intervene for one moment here and maybe just ask the Ethics Commission representatives to talk about, so I think we're talking about two different kinds of disclosure requirements. And if we could just clarify the nonprofit, the change in what you're proposing for when nonprofits are asked to disclose is not related to who's coming to a, you know, not related to when you're coming to testify at a city council meeting, right? Correct, that's how we understood, we under, we understood President Krikorian's a uh, proposal to only address registration in terms of a lobbyist and uh, the council member Blumenfeld's proposal um, and Harris Dawson's um, uh, co-proposal there to address only when individuals are speaking before um, 
council not necessarily tied to any registration or not and we will have more discussion on that so well but wait because right now we have a draft MLO or proposal that's before us and we're talking about exemptions from that so I'm talking about narrowing the exemption from that so that the disclosure requirements which I just mentioned a moment ago that are going to be in this MLO update would apply to a broader range of speakers. Um, beyond that, beyond what's before us right now, the discussion has been, let's look at going even further and requiring disclosure from anybody who's being compensated to be there. That's, that is not today's discussion. That's, a discu that's the next step in this process. But today there will be disclosure requirements that we're gonna be agreeing to among the newly defined registered lobbyists. Does that make sense? Correct, that's how I, we understood it. Okay. So we're narrowing the exemption from registration as a lobbyist to pick up more uh, nonprofits to be subject to the registration unless they fit under some other exemption, which probably would not be likely. Chair, can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah, please. One thing I'm worried about, and I don't know if I should be or not, which is I don't want to discourage nonprofits from testifying. And if we're saying that this lower threshold, that, that, that means not only do they have to disclose who they're from, they now have to register as a lobbyist and go through all that. It's a lot of paperwork. Um, are we disincentivizing nonprofits from from speaking um, when our goal is to get disclosure it's not necessarily to uh, subject them to all the rules and regulations of a lobbyist yeah and, and I guess you know the the difficulty that I have is you know there a, a lot of this discussion that we have about ethics reform sometimes gets caught up in um, in f some false assumptions, you know, uh, a nonprofit is doing good for the people. A lobbyist is evil. You know, well, neither of those two is necessarily true at all. Um, and you know, it's, it's routine now that advocacy groups or uh, special interests create their own nonprofits. And so I, I don't see how we uh, can avoid addressing this nonprofit issue um, and, and including them as equal partners in uh, the municipal lobbying ordinance. But at the same time, we don't want to create this, as we discussed earlier, create this minefield for the unwary for some you know, local community nonprofit that isn't normally coming and talking to council a lot and, um, and, and just tripping them up by having them not register and uh, that becomes something that, they, that they're um, penalized for. Or, or perversely incentivizing nonprofits to hire lobbyists because now, <laughs> I mean, in a weird way we might be doing that because now you know, a nonprofit that would otherwise speak to us directly uh, is doesn't want to get caught up in all that, so they hire a lobbyist, and now we've. I mean, that's not our goal either. But I, I but I, I agree with you. There is a real risk with the astroturf nonprofits that we want to make sure those get captured, or at least get disclosed. Yeah, and it's it's not even just astroturf. I mean, you know, nonprofits include some major enterprises. Yeah, and um, it's. It's just legitimate, I think, for the public to know uh, which enterprise is behind uh, that, that comment and, and to know what potentially inequitable influence they're having in decision making um, by, you know, by lobbying. That, that's the point of this, I think. Um, so the other issue that I have a, a little bit of a, well, no, a couple of other, let me just mention a couple of the concerns that I have and then I'll come back uh, to this. Um, number one, a, as the proposal 
it, particularly in the in the ramen motions currently laid out, it, it refers to fund fundraising by um, by lobbyists. And I know the Ethics Commission and the Council and many others have struggled for many many years in trying to figure out what are the boundaries of restrictions on uh, on spending and on fundraising uh, that would be consistent with um, the First Amendment and, and otherwise. And um, I know San Francisco has an ordinance that really doesn't limit fundraising, as I understand it. It limits bundling. Um, can, can anybody speak to that, speak to the potential legal issues that are involved there uh, and you know how we would define fundraising in a way that might be able to withstand constitutional scrutiny? And uh, if anybody from the city attorney's office wants to jump in on this, that's fine uh, too. Oh, Council member uh, Renee Stottle from the city attorney's office. Uh, we, uh, um, we don't want to give any uh, specific legal advice on the permissibility of a fundraising restriction on the public record. Um, <clears throat> as a general matter, uh, the Supreme Court and other courts, including the California Supreme Court, have um, evaluated contribution and fundraising restrictions over the years. Um, and in general, uh, the more narrow a restriction is, the more likely or the less likely that a court will over, overturn it. Now, that doesn't mean that um, any restriction would pass. Uh, scrutiny and we're happy to answer specific questions in a confidential communication to you. Okay. Um, this does, you know, having some broad restriction on fundraising does seem to go um, afield from where we are uh, with the MLO, even in the proposed ethics uh, commission updates and I am pretty concerned that we're swimming into very dangerous constitutional waters that could potentially even lead to some of the things that we have now on the books um, being challenged and um, so I, 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 I'd be comfortable I think going forward with something that's roughly modeled on the San Francisco ordinance because at least that has um, you know been on the books for a little bit and uh, as far as I know it, it has not been no one has even attempted to challenge it at this point is that right as far as we know yes that's correct um, and just um, to follow up a little bit uh, what San Francisco um, prohibits is the delivery of uh, contributions, so it doesn't um, it doesn't expand into other activities. It's the delivery of contributions, right? Um, which, you know, that that's an I would argue. I'm not the city attorney, but I would argue that is an action that's not necessarily uh, impeding their free speech rights, even as defined by the Supreme Court involving money, because it's, it's, it, it involves essentially the delivery of, um, of raised funds rather than the actual communicative part of, of raising funds that a, a fundraising constraint would have. So I, I think that's a more defensible approach. Um, what else did I want to raise? Um, delivery means like physically delivering a check or I don't know what that means. I don't have the San Francisco ordinance language in front of me. Maybe someone else does, but it, it really goes to um, delivering contributions either directly or through a third party. It's the practice that I think most people think of as bundling. That's if anybody has that San Francisco ordinance and can share, share it or, or can describe it, that would be helpful. I 
do not have it at my fingertips. Tyler, is that something you have that you could share? I do, yes. So this is the language provided by the San Francisco Ethics Commission uh, from when this was approved by the voters. So this specifically is the bundling of campaign contributions under, under the uh, section entitled Prohibitions. And if the council president doesn't mind, I'll just read this off. Yeah, please, please, please. So it says, no lobbyist shall deliver or transmit or deliver or transmit through a third party any contribution made by another person to any city elective officer or candidate for city elective office or any city elective officers or candidates controlled committees if that lobbyist is registered to lobby the agency for which the candidate is seeking election or the agency of the city elective officer or B has been registered to lobby that agency in the previous 90 days. So that, that's what San Francisco has had on the books now for I think five or six years and it hasn't been challenged yet. Um, whereas we know that just about every constraint on the actual act of fundraising or spending does get challenged. Um, so I would, I would suggest that we move forward with something modeled after what San Francisco has done. Um, and then the other thing that I had was, um, I think Mr. Blumenfield raised the issue about uh, placing restricted source restrictions on clients as well as registered lobbyists just by virtue of the fact that they have a lobbyist. And this is an area that gives me a lot of heartburn for the clients, many of whom are, you know, may not have any awareness even of what a lobbyist is doing on behalf of that entity when they have a gala or something and they invite um, a council member to come and, you know, attend their gala or something. You know, the, so it, it seems like we're treating entities in a disparate way based on whether or not they have hired a lobbyist. And, and that doesn't see, there's, I don't understand what the policy justification would be for doing that. Now, if a lobbyist is using the client as a way to do things that the lobbyist would otherwise be prohibited from doing, that's another issue. But that's something I think we should address head on rather than trying to get into it uh, in, a, in, a, in this way. Um, so I, I would suggest that the provisions that we have on restricted sources be um, not encompass the um, uh, the, uh, the clients themselves. So anyway, that being said, let me just um, run through a few um, suggestions and make sure that everybody generally agrees. So I'm going to recommend that we adopt the recommendations in the report from the City Ethics Commission dated May 5th, 2022 and request that the city attorney prepare and present an ordinance codifying changes to the municipal lobbying ordinance with the following changes. Amend proposed LAMC section 4801E to clarify that a proposed or pending matter of municipal legislation includes matters without a council file or official report that are newly raised by lobbying entities or their clients. Amend proposed LAMC section 48.03C uh, as follows. A person performing pursuant to a contract with a city agency unless seeking a change in law, regulation, or policy. For purposes of this section, a written response to a written request from an agency pursuant to, I think the rest remains the same. Um, so that is the proposed section that deals with um, agency contracts and um, I'm trying to add language to that to exclude from the exclusion any party that has an agency contract but is nonetheless seeking a change in law, regulation, or policy. Um, four, amend proposed LAMC section 48.03E as follows, and I already read that language that deals with the IRS code. Uh, restrictions. 
five, uh, amend the governmental ethics ordinance section 49.5.2 as follows. Um, and then uh, in the definition J for restricted source um, for elected city officers, um, I would strike the language or is a client as defined in section 48.02. And then in the subsection for all other city officials, likewise, I would propose striking or as a client as defined in section 48.02. Six, amend LAMC section 48.05 to require that lobbying rec records be maintained for at least five years. Seven, amend LAMC section 4811 to require lobbyists to de disclose that they are lobbyists and the name of their client whenever they give public comment or make a presentation on behalf of a client in any meeting subject to the Brown Act or communicate in writing on behalf of a client with city personnel. Eight, amend LAMC section 48.12 throughout to change the Ethics Commission's statute of limitations from four to five years. Nine, add a new requirement that prohibits lobbying entities from delivering or bundling campaign contributions for city candidates and office holders modeled after San Francisco's 2016 law and 10, authorize the city attorney with the assistance of the Ethics Commission to make any technical changes or adjustments to the above instructions to effectuate the intent of these instructions. And uh, if that has not already been distributed to everybody, I hope it can be so you don't have to take notes of everything I just said. Uh, Council Member Rahman. Um, I was just wondering whether you could clarify the changes to I think it was um, Amendment 2, uh, which is a person performing, basically related to agency contract and work related to that. If you could read the whole oh, yeah. text yeah, yeah. for that, yeah. that would be useful for us to understand exactly how that's Yeah, changed. and I'm sorry, because we're, we're taking an ordinance, and then we're amending the ordinance. Yes, it's no, neg I it, It's negative, it's triple negative sometimes. So yeah, let me just read the whole thing. <clears throat> Okay, so amend proposed LAMC section 48.03C as follows. A person performing pursuant to, and then I would strike out an agency contract, and I would replace it with a contract with a city agency unless seeking a change in law, regulation, or policy. For purposes of this section, a written response to a written request from an agency pursuant to an agency contract directed individually to a contracted party for information, input, or feedback shall not constitute a communication involving a, a potential change in law, regulation, or policy. So, and then that latter language is intended to allow communication that doesn't involve a broader effort to change policy, but rather it's pursuant to the contractual relationship between the agency and the city. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and then uh, the other part of those instructions, of course, should include the recommendation uh, first proposed by Mr. Blumenfield for the report back on a broader set of recommendations for um, disclosure of a compensation relationship by anyone, whether registered lobbyist or not, who is providing testimony or making a presentation. Okay, so that is what I would recommend and put before us. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, let's go ahead and call the roll. Krikorian? Aye. Rahman? Yes. Blumenfield? Aye. Harris Dawson? Yes. Hutt? Absent? Hernandez? Yes. Park? 
Yes. Six eyes and uh, those recommendations have been approved as amended. Very good. Thank you very much. That brings us, and thank you all again very much. Great, robust, uh, you know, deep discussion, substantive stuff. Thank you all very much uh, for everybody who worked on this. Um, all right, let's go next to item number two. Item number two, Chief Legislative Analyst to report relative to options for a ballot measure for the November 2022 ballot to amend the city charter to create an independent redistricting commission for the city and related matters. Okay, uh, before I turn it over to Mr. Wickham, again, further to the subject of things getting sidelined sometimes in the past, uh, Council Member Rahman and I brought the motion, and I think other members have at other times brought similar motions to create a truly independent redistricting commission for the city, which again, you know, was put under a rock someplace and never saw the time of day. Um, so we are now moving forward and I want to especially thank the CLA's office because this is a big lift uh, to create an entirely new redistricting system and there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, that, you know, have pluses and minuses. And the CLA has been doing exhaustive work to ensure that this council has before it um, a, the range of options necessary to be able to determine what's best uh, for the people of Los Angeles. And then to get that on the ballot so that the people of Los Angeles can in fact um, make that determination. So uh, I wanna thank uh, Mr. Wickham in particular, and uh, all of the folks at the CLA for, for working so hard on this. So, uh, Mr. Wickham, I'm going to turn it over to you to give us an update on where we are. Um, good afternoon, members. Uh, John Wickham with the Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, I wanted to give you uh, just a quick overview of the work we're doing. The, uh, as you know, the motion uh, to initiate this work is quite substantial. It was uh, about three pages, more, almost still three pages with a wide range of issues that we were asked to review. And so it is taking uh, quite a lot of time to make sure that we identify the appropriate models for independent redistricting commissions and compare them. We've looked at, and, and it's interesting, some, some commissions have been identified as independent and they're actually not quite as independent as you would think. Um, so we did try to make sure that we were evaluating what is truly independent within the context of state law and, um, and provide comparison for you. So we looked at 10 cities, three counties, the California State Commission, as well as the California Fair Maps Act. And all of them have provided very helpful and interesting information on how to approach this. What we've learned is that over the last 20 years, the concept of independent commission is, has changed. It's grown a lot of new ideas and concerns and ideas have come into the models that have been developed. And so you, what you are actually will benefit from is the evolution in this concept. Um, and you will be able to develop a very robust independent redistricting um, model for, for a presentation to voters. Um, what, um, and what we're finding is that there are some things that even the current models uh, have, may not have considered as well. So you'll get uh, some new concepts as well. For example, we haven't found any model that has a clear explanation of what the duties of, an, of a redistricting commission are. And so making sure that you have the opportunity to clearly define um, roles and responsibilities for everybody involved is really important. Um, it is a substantial and detailed report and we uh, want to make sure that all of these issues are clearly presented. As you heard from public testimony, there is a great deal of interest in this. And we want to make sure that we cover the issue uh, well and provide references to sources for the models, et cetera. So as we're just making, the report is substantially done. We're just making sure that we tie up all the loose ends because everything is really integrated. Um, the structure of the report is that the front part has 
a description of each of the of the subject areas within redistricting commission, such uh, an independent redistricting commission. So, the purpose of a commission, how it's organized, qualifications, responsibilities, and restrictions for the commissioner, um, the selection and removal process for commissioners, the 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 requirements and criteria for redistricting generally. The, the process that a commission should go through, such as how, you know, requirements for public hearings and public input and how to uh, deal with that. Um, maintaining records and data, how to deal with data, um, how to fund the program and, and several funding issues. Um, there are a number of administrative and operations issues that need to be considered as well as legal, um, legal uh, challenge processes. And then um, we do touch on the fact that uh, LAUSD also needs to be included in a, an independent redistricting process as uh, instructed in the, um, the council action. The first question that we saw in all of the models was, or first instruction we saw in all of the models was how many, count, how many districts will be drawn in the jurisdiction? And so that caused us to bring into this discussion the question of the size of the city council, because that, that was an independent motion. So our report does review the history of the size of the Los Angeles City Council um, and other issue um, options for um, how to go about changing and dealing with um, the size of the city council. So you'll have that question in front of you as well. The, um, as I said, the structure of the report is that there's a, a, a front end that's a, a substantial discussion of all of these components. And then the second half of the report provides you an option matrix. So you can go through and build however you want to build your redistricting, um, independent redistricting process. You could build one or two or three different models. And then that would give you an opportunity to compare options and, and solutions for moving this forward and also give the public the opportunity to uh, see which options make sense for the city of Los Angeles. Um, there were there are three um, issues I'll just bring up to you real quick because they actually flow into um, the discussion you might have on items three and four on the agenda today. Um, one is the length of term of the commission. So some commissions um, exist for just a couple of years so that the map can be drawn and approved and then the commission goes away. Some of the commissions actually have a life of 10 years and they then help select the next commission that comes in after them. This is going to be a very significant and important structural decision for you to make because it flows out into all of the other decision components that you'll make in the process. So you'll, you'll want to be thinking about that. Um, the number of commissioners is, is very important. Um, we've, during the last process, we heard complaints that 21 commissioners is too many. Our current process requires 21 commissioners. And there was a feeling that was too many. Well, SB 52 has 24 commissioners. So they've actually gone in a direction of including more commissioners. But what this results in is issues about how you get to you, what your number is and then how you select them. And there are, you, you will want to balance geographic representation in the city with other diversity factors in, in the city. And so it's easy to cover the geography selection process if you have one per council district. Each council district has an equal number of people in it. So that helps you get there. But now you're starting at a base of 15 and you're adding on to that to get to a diversity selection process. And so um, in SB 52, for example, they, they do a random selection process. Most of it's geographic for 21 of the commissioners and then they only have three that are selected from a diversity process. So you, in that process, for example, you will run a very big risk that you will not have good, appropriate, diverse representation on, the, on that model. So you'll want to find ways to balance these questions of how many commissioners there are, how many are selected from a geographic random selection process, and then how many are selected through a, a directed 
um, subjective diversity selection process. And then throughout all of this, who is involved in these decision-making processes? Who's involved in the selection process? Um, and what degree of independence do they have from whoever you want them to be independent from? Do you want them to be independent from the city council, from all elected officials, from appointed officials, right? So there are degrees of independence in all of this. And so you'll want to um, consider at any given point, is there um, a potential for influence to affect the direction of the process here? And how do you address that? So these are really big questions. Um, you're going to have a very, very robust conversation um, in the meetings ahead for you. And um, uh, we, we intend to get the report out to you as soon as possible so that you can start that conversation. So with that, I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much. And, and I, I love that you're creating a decision matrix for us. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield will, rem will remember when we've had decision matrices before us, and that's a, it's a great way to, to really um, tackle really complicated policies one step at a time in a thoughtful way. And um, it sounds like the homework that you've done and, and the thought that you've already given to it in identifying the many issues that are involved um, is already extremely thorough. And this committee's debate and discussion about those issues will similarly be very thorough and this will will likely take take multiple meetings to actually get through all this um, but if I may just skipping ahead to our discussion about SB 52 that's all the more reason why we have to do this and not um, abandon our responsibility to the state legislature, which may or may not have any ability to do any of this analysis, may or may not even be aware of the nuances that uh, are within the city of Los Angeles, may not be familiar with our neighborhood councils uh, and, and all the many other things that are you know, specific to Los Angeles that the voters of Los Angeles will need to take into account. To Mr. Blumenfield's point about tying this issue with the expansion of the council. I, you can't do, you, you know, if you're going to do the one, you've got to do the other, um, you know, in concert with that. And so a, a state mandated uh, program, which may or may not take that into account, to me is just would, would be, it would be, it would be a poor way to make policy. But even beyond that, it would be a blatant abrogation of this council's uh, authority and responsibility under the city charter. And, and in my view, unconstitutional. Uh, the state legislature just doesn't have the ability to tell a charter city how we should draw our districts or run our elections. They just don't. So um, anyway, that's so thank you for that, uh, John. And um, I don't think we need to take any action on, on item two at this time other than to uh, continue the discussion forward and to wish you well as you continue to finalize uh, the report. Um, I would like to go ahead and move on then to items three and four. And um, as I think I signaled my pass uh, just a minute ago, um, I'm calling for us to actually take a, an, an affirmative opposed position on SB 52 for these very reasons. The fact that um, the state legislative process does not accommodate the kinds of nuanced decision making that we're going to have to make. And I, I think it clearly oversteps the legal authority of the state legislature to, uh, to encroach in our um, election process. So I'm going to ask us to take a, a vote in opposition and, uh, Ms. and Mr. Bloomfield, go right ahead. Sorry, on item two, just, a, just wanted to make a comment for Mr. Wickham as, yeah. uh, as you go back and do this report to, to include the issue that a lot of people don't think about, which is the numbering of districts. 
um, because people don't realize, unlike a lot of areas where there every council member is or, or elected official, whatever the body is, is elected at the same time, we are staggered. And so the way those numbers are put together is a critical decision because otherwise you end up having existing council members potentially being drawn into seats that they don't currently represent um, and not being able to run for the seat that they do represent because they still have two years remaining on their term. So that's, that's a nuance that has been dealt with and I'm, I'm hoping that there will be options for that as well. But we've, seen, we've seen, I think, uh, two different models that address numbering specifically. And so we will provide that um, in our report. And as I understand it, there there are even potential. Well, there's there's complicated issues that are involved when the redistricting process happens, and uh, only half of the uh, districts are, you know, up for re-election. Uh, there's a there's that gap period between the redrawing of the districts to when new members are elected, and it there are complicated legal questions that arise from that as well that I think we need to grab by the horns and deal with as well. Um, Council Member Hernandez. Thank you, Council President. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Wickham, for the work that you've been doing around this. Uh, just a quick question. Is there any precedent for the state stepping in like this in other areas or jurisdictions? Uh, they have done this at the county, but um, counties have a different relationship with the state. The the state constitution has very specific language about charter cities having the right to run their elections. And so redistricting is part of the election, election process. And so charter cities like the city of Los Angeles have a very unique position and situation in the state constitution. So I would actually want to have the city attorney provide um, greater analysis of that question for you. Um, but yeah, it's, um, that's, that's the starting point on that, but your CLA will always recommend that you oppose any legislation that interferes with your home rule rights as a charter city. Wonderful. Thank you. And you just made me think about something else. If I could just ask really quickly, Sure. what, what is the process, uh, what would it look like for the, what process would the state bill utilize to create this commission that we're talking, that we're talking about? They, they, have, um, they would have a bill that had been introduced, for example, SB 52 was the model that um, is the approach that's being used right now. So that is what they would do. Got it, thank you. So it's outlined there, we'll look there then. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rahm. I just wanted to, I don't think we have to take a decision on this today or figure it out today, but I did want to flag that there is a private, you know, a philanthropically funded report on this issue on redistricting that I believe should be coming out at some point in the next few months as well. And I think it would be good for, you know, the purpose of this committee, which is to kind of establish public trust in this process for us also to consider that report alongside the work that the city is doing. I don't imagine that they will be bringing us significant new stuff, because it sounds like what you're doing is very comprehensive, um, Mr. Wickham, but I did just want to flag that, that is out there, and uh, I would you know, recommend that we offer some space for them to provide a presentation on it in the committee. And Mr. Wickham, have they been in communication with you? Yes, they have. Um, so I, ha I have had a couple of conversations with them, and they, I, I think we see the work comp as complementary, and there will be points in the decision process where you will benefit from having a deeper academic dive into the issue. Um, and so, yeah, I think there are several issues where you'll see the um, it's very complementary and, and beneficial for the work that they're doing. Yeah, and, and, you know, what I told them when they were originally talking about this was th we would love to have 
you know, as much information and as many suggestions as we possibly can have. So in addition to the work that the CLA is doing, any philanthropic report or report from anybody else um, who wants to submit ideas and suggestions for this, this is going to be a very, necessarily, a very robust, open, transparent, um, you know, publicly driven uh, uh, decision-making process that we're going to go through because the whole objective is to come up with a redistricting process that is exactly that too. And so the, the more input we can have about that, as far as I'm concerned, the better. Okay, so um, let's see. I think um, we don't need to take any action, I guess, on item number two because that's uh, still a work in pro uh, progress. So we'll just go ahead and um, continue to hold that in the committee. Um, on item number three, I would request uh, an I vote. And on item number four on today's agenda, I would uh, just recommend if there's no objection, we'll note and file that item in committee. So, um, any other comments or questions about that, members? Okay, then on those recommendations, let's go ahead and open the roll. Mr. Chair, I will yeah. uh, proceed to read the items into the record and then uh, we'll go for the roll call. All right. Item number three, resolution Krikorian Raman relative to including the city's 2023-2024 state legislative program, opposition to SB 52 Durazo, which would establish the city of Los Angeles Citizens Redistricting Commission to adjust the district boundaries for the Los Angeles City Council. Item number four, resolution Rodriguez Price relative to including in the city's 2023-2024 state legislative program, sponsorship and support of any legislation applicable to any city with a population greater than 3 million, which would urge the state of California through an emergency clause to move forward expeditiously on a bill structured similarly to SB 958, County of Los Angeles Citizens Redistricting Commission, Laura Hall, that creates an independent process with a new commission and new redistricting maps for the city of Los Angeles before the April 2023 special election. Okay, so again, I would propose uh, an I vote on item number three and that we note and file item four. Uh, let's go ahead on those recommendations and open the roll, please. Krikorian? Aye. Raman? Yes. Blumenfield? Aye. Harris Dawson. Yes. Hutt, absent. Hernandez. Yes. Park. Yes. Six ayes, and those recommendations have been approved as stated by the chair. Very good. Mr. Suh, is there anything else before us? Mr. Chair, the desk is clear. Very good. Thank you, members. Uh, very, very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I hope we'll have a lot of those in this committee. I appreciate um, your service as we continue to, to work to regain the confidence of the public uh, through governance reform. So thank you all very, very much. And uh, thank you to all the staff who worked so hard on these items as well. Uh, with that, if there's no objection, we are adjourned. Have a thank good day, you. everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.